uh, may change, uh, and this is uh, based on an exceeding 10 per, 10 per 100,000 residents or 10% of the population testing positive on a 10 day rolling average. So, you know, we've seen these cases spiking, uh, particularly in states like Florida and Texas. Uh, the governor has also just recently issued an order that air travelers to New York must fill out a form. Uh, and uh, we'll have uh, the Councilman Bragman will give us an update on what we're doing here with our own airport later in the meeting today. Uh, but we also have redoubled our efforts to let any travelers to our area understand that if they come from one of these hotspot states or have traveled to one of these hotspot states in the last 14 days, they are required to quarantine. This is an effort to keep the spread of the disease from reinfecting New York, which is uh, now enjoying a very low infection rate. We don't want to go backwards. We want people to continue to be wearing masks. This is the most effective way to prevent the spread of the disease. Also, please, you know, uh, disinfect commonly used services. Continually wash your hands. Uh, we don't want to have a resurgence. Uh, we've all sacrificed a great deal to get us to this point. We want to keep the good news coming. Uh, do we have Carol on the line yet? We do. Carol, would you please do a roll call? Councilwoman Burke Gonzalez? Present. Councilman Lease? Present. Councilwoman Overby? Sylvia, you're muted. Sorry, here. Councilman Bragman? Here. Supervisor Vance Goyette? Present. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America. America. To and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today's meeting will start with a public portion where any member of the public may dial in and address the board, uh, ask any questions or make any comments you wish on any topic. The uh, topics for discussion among the board in the work session will be HMMH, which is the uh, the annual airport traffic review. This will give us an update on the traffic for the previous year, 2019, compared to uh, the previous years, I believe dating back to 2015, when the town board mm -hmm. first attempted to institute restrictions. Uh, that'll be followed by a discussion led by Councilman Lease about the Oak Grove Cemetery. Some years ago, we purchased adjoining property to that cemetery with plans of enlarging it for the public. David has an update on that with uh, proposed plans. Uh, we also have a request from the DEC to continue their bat research project, uh, specifically uh, regarding the long-eared bat, which is an endangered species within New York. And uh, we'll have an update on that, uh, followed by liaison reports. So without any further ado, Michael, do we have any callers in? Yes, we do. We presently have four callers, and I will unmute the Great. first caller right now. Excellent. Thank you. Hello, caller. You're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Could you please state your name? Hello, caller. Are you there? Seems like we have a bad connection. Hello, caller. I'm um, sorry, but we do have. We asked that caller to try back again. Yes, please. Try Could calling us out? back again. Thank you. I'll move on to the next caller. Oh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Hello. Who's calling? Please. Oh, hi. Okay. I, um, my name is Scott Munson, and I actually live in Astoria, uh, New York, but I'm calling in support of closing the airport. Um, we are getting slammed over here with helicopters that are transitioning to the North Shore route to get out to you all uh, to the East Hampton Airport. I know that because I track them. Um, I also have, I have a lot of stats if you're interested. I was just looking at my stats and I see that um, I filed uh, last year um, during uh, I'm not exactly sure of the period because I sort of just put in for the whole year, but um, it was probably something like between, you know, May and October or something like that. 
um, I filed 1,021 complaints in that period. Of course, not all of them are going to be helicopters going out to you, but the majority, if I was to put it, if I was to download it to the spreadsheet, you know, I could, uh, you know, I could uh, suss out the stats, and I, you know, I, which I've done before, and I would say, you know, something like 95% of them are going out to the East Hamptons or 90%, I don't know, I'd have to, you know, really dig into those numbers. But I do have the stats. Um, so, uh, you know, the helicopters, they don't follow, they fly very low over us. We've, we've owned our house here in Astoria uh, since 1998, and this all really, you know, picked up a few years ago when, there was, when the North Shore route was mandated. That's when I saw a huge uptick. I'm uh, both my wife and I are musicians. I'm very sensitive to sound, so I noticed it right away. And they typically fly over us at an altitude of between 1,200 and 1,800 feet, but the majority of them fly under 1,500 feet over us. Um, the big, you know, the big helicopters that are very loud. Um, and I know they also go over Astoria Park. They go over this big residential area of Astoria. I don't understand why they can't just stay over the river and then hang a right. You know, I think it has maybe has something to do with LaGuardia, but um, I certainly think they sh they could be following the river route more. But they they just don't. They transition over us, and it's it's been a it's been a real it's a real pain. I mean, I you know as as many, uh, I'm sure, out there, I mean, I, you know, our walls shake sometimes when they go over us. So anyway, I am in support of closing the airport. So that's my, that's my two cents. Thanks for taking the time to call us, Scott. We, okay. Hi, Scott. We, we certainly appreciate you calling us, and we understand that, uh, you know, air, air traffic noise, um, particularly helicopter traffic to and from East Hampton, uh, really does affect so many people well beyond our own town borders. And uh, we appreciate the time you've taken to call us today. And we'd be happy if you would share any of the uh, information that you've, uh, the data that you've ac accumulated there. If you'd okay, like to share. How far back do you want me to go? Well, it, that'd be up to you. I don't know, you said the last couple of years. Okay. You have a spreadsheet or whatever sure. you know we'd be happy if you'd send it to us okay and thanks so much um uh, how, what, what email do i send it to uh you can send it to me jay jay bragman at e hampton ny.gov i'm the liaison to the airport it's on it's on our, our website you can send it to any, the, any of the council um, people the, or the town clerk as well. It's just, uh, if you go to the East Hampton Town website, okay. any of the board members or the town clerk's email will do. Okay, because I, I, I have Gene Hudson's email. Can I send it there? That would work. Yeah. Yes, that's fine. That He's the legislative secretary for two okay. of the council people. Thanks so much for taking okay. the time to Thank call us, Scott. So Be well. Bye-bye. Okay, you too. Goodbye. We have another caller, Mike. Yes, we do. Just one moment. Hello, caller. You're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Could you please state your name? Hello, caller. Are you there? Hearing nothing, Moose to the supervisor. I'll move on. Hello, caller. You're Hello? live with the Town Board. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning, Rana. Hello. Good morning. Oh, you're beginning to recognize my voice, huh? I, yeah, I, you have a um, distinctive voice. How are you today? Yeah, well, we all, we all do. Thank you. Uh, I listened at the beginning. You were talking about uh, all of the states, uh, which uh, they are uh, looking out for, for visitors to East Hampton. And you listed them, but last night, Amagansett Citizens Advisory had a meeting. Uh, Chief Solo was on the meeting, and somebody asked him a question about if somebody came here from Florida, how would he be able to handle that? And he said there, is, there are no plans. He has no idea. So listing all those states is admirable, but what is the town going to do about it? 
So the governor has declared that anyone traveling from those states is supposed to quarantine. Uh, I don't know that there's... Uh, uh, Who's watching out for that? Because the chief has no idea. He said there is no plan. He would not he would not know what to do in order to handle any visitors from out of state here. I think in clarifying what the chief was is that the governor's executive order came out very late in that day. And as he was preparing for uh, Amagansett Citizens Advisory Committee by looking into things that might be more centric to Amagansett, as he said, he's going through those reports uh, and, and talking with him this morning and seeing the executive order come out and how we have to deal with it at our airports based on some of our council memos, uh, that he'll be looking into it. Uh, so at that moment, that might have been the answer, but he he is looking into it based on our attorney's office, uh, with, in, in conjunction with our attorney's office. So, so Rona, we have, we have... That order came down weeks ago from, from the governor, because uh, I watch all of... Rona, there's two so things going on here. First of all, the governor issued on June 25th that people traveling from a list of states, if the, if the population, uh, the percent of infection rate was 10% or more uh, from a state with a seven day rolling average, that anyone traveling from those states within the last 14 days would have to quarantine. And we put out a press release and we started informing the public of this requirement. And what happened yesterday was he declared that there would be stepped up enforcement at airports in New York for air travelers coming into the state and that there was a new requirement that they must file a form uh, or uh, risk a $2,000 a $2, fine. Uh, again, this, this, I don't know that the state has any plan for following up to make sure anyone who is coming in is actually quarantining or not. And uh, I don't know that uh, that the town has the resources. Uh, I don't see us closing the state highway and doing a checkpoint and then informing people uh, of this requirement. We have been actively pursuing informing the public of this requirement uh, through our uh, public communications, and we're going to continue to do so. Uh, Mr. Bragman has stated uh, a follow-up with the airport and the plans there. There's been discussion about hiring a seasonal person to meet air travelers as they arrive, to uh, let them know of this requirement. Um, so, you know, again, the governor has made statements about what's necessary. Uh, he hasn't provided any resources uh, to date for follow through or any process to follow up on uh, other than the public information, which we have been putting out. Well, it seems to me the town should have some sort of plan uh, since he, since the governor has issued this statement. Yes, yeah, so our plan was to inform the public, Rona. The air, the, let me finish, Peter. Uh, Please. The airport is a good first. I mean, that's a plan that people coming in by plane should be, you know, should check in. But what's going to happen otherwise? I mean, what other plans do you have? We had the same question on this on the call with the state yesterday, Ron, because they didn't address yeah, oh, any of the people. I'm sorry, they didn't address any of the people traveling by cars, buses, trains, or trucks. So, you know, again and again, I believe the enforcement effort he spoke to was only at the major commercial air, airports. Uh, we're taking that a step further. Um, it's it's not a requirement as I understood it, and trying to get further clarification from the state for the town to take an active role in finding out if people are traveling here from one of those states at our airport, but that's something we're gonna do anyway. Well, can code enforcement look for license plates? I mean, when they're going around in their, in their uh, exploits, you know, around that different hamlets, if they see a, a Florida plate to check on it? Beyond just informing the public, there's really, I don't think, too much that we can do. I think it's really important that we inform the public and that we urge them the importance of complying with that. Well, I look forward to some sort of plan from the town uh, as to what you intend to do. Uh, since you listed all the states, I mean, uh, that's Again, I, I, I think I've described to... what, our plan, what our plan is at this point. It's to continue to inform the public as to this requirement. But beyond that, I don't know. 
uh, what you know can reasonably ex be expected. Thank you. Thank you for calling. You well, Rona. Mike, do we have any other callers? Yes, we do. I'll be unmuting the next caller right now. Hello, caller. You're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Hello, caller. Are you there? Hearing nothing, Mr. Supervisor, I'll move on. Hello, caller. You're live with oh, the Town my. Board. Hello, Hello, caller. You're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Can you please state your name? I thought I heard something, but... <laughs> I did, too. Okay. Hearing nothing, there is one more caller on hold. This is that previous caller that wasn't there. Hello. Uh, hello, caller. Can you state your name? <laughs> yes, Bruce Nowakinski. Hi, Bruce. How are you? Good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I wanted to thank uh, David Lees for getting back to us about the town uh, dock uh, marina uh, bulkhead uh, repair and the uh, <laughs> benches in the future that may be coming down the road in the budget. Uh, but also... Uh, I, I I have to say that uh, cell phone service in Springs has always been bad, but now it's horrendous. I can't even go out my back door without the cell phone not working. And I think between the crowds and bandwidth and cell tower issue, which I'd like to hear if you know anything, an update, because I think this is getting, feel like an emergency. If, if, a, if a cable wire goes down at my house and I lose my phone service, I would go to my cell. Now I can't. So if there's an emergency at my house, I'm going to be stuck. And I don't know if you have any new information regarding the cell tower. We, we, we do expect an update uh, at the upcoming work session uh, on the emergency communication system and the implementation of that. And I do know that with the uh, increased numbers of people here in East Hampton, uh, that the system is, is really quite overloaded. And uh, so, you know, one of the one of the things that I, I will say again, I've said this before, is everybody uh, seems to want improved cell service, but when applications come before our local regulatory boards, we only hear opposition, and the, those boards, I think, need to hear from the public if there's support for uh, improved communications. Uh, you know, you can't you can't really have it both ways. Uh, you, you can't really expect to have improved service and not allow uh, any additional uh, increase in bandwidth. So, you know, I, I know that it's an important uh, issue. Uh, we are working to address this in a comprehensive way. We have hired um, a consulting attorney to help us uh, navigate that. We intend to rewrite the town's uh, cell code, which is outdated, does not reflect the um, FCC law changes that was written before the most recent FCC uh, uh, legislation, which uh, really should be reflected in our own code. And uh, again, I think it's important to have a comprehensive look at our cell coverage throughout the entire town rather than to continue uh, relying on providers to make requests for uh, coverage for their own, uh, you know, customers. Yeah, I called AT and T uh, Mobile, and they seemed to think it was all going to be resolved in the next few days. And their cell tower uh, 
equipment would be giving us great service. Is there a reason why the Salmon's Tower is not usable? Which tower? Spring, Springs Fireplace and Abrams Path. It used to be called the Salmon's Tower. Oh, uh, it's the uh, Cablevision Tower at, at Abraham's Path and, and Springs Fireplace. That is owned by Altice, right. and I've actually had some discussions with them about um, about having uh, carriers on that tower. It's an existing tower. I think it's nearly 300 feet tall, and um, my understanding of the history of it is when the Dolan family owned Cablevision that they were adamantly opposed to allowing any cell service uh, because they felt that that would be potentially in competition with their company. Altice, I don't think, is the same approach. Um, since I've been talking to them, uh, they seem to be willing to consider uh, improvements uh, of their infrastructure. As you may know, they've they're in the process of completely rewiring the town uh, from the old coaxial type cable to fiber optic, which will increase the bandwidth considerably within their network. But again, I think I think taking a comprehensive approach, uh, because so many people do rely on their cell phones for emergency communications and every other aspect of their life, that that's something the town has to continue to move forward. So, so the, the the people going around town hauling cable from pole to pole are workers that are hired by Altice. Yes, they're Altice contractors, and that's all new fiber optic cable. Well, has so, anybody they, checked to see if they're in, interfering with the internet service because we've they are the internet service. <laughs> Yeah, that, that that their system has been completely overloaded, and uh, they've had to split the number of nodes throughout the town in order to meet the traffic. And in addition, most of that infrastructure was somewhat antiquated, especially given the demand here. And the they expect that once that system is completely that footprint's completely in place, that uh, the internet speeds uh, will in, increase into the multiple gigabyte. Uh, and right now, although uh, Altice claims to have a 400 megabyte service, um, if you pay for that service, my guess is you're probably not getting half of that speed currently, um, given the, the uh, constraints. So, you know, we expect uh, once that's done that the internet service provided by Altice will improve dramatically, as will some of the cell coverage they they have a, an agreement with uh, sprint i believe uh, for coverage but again i think you know not everybody has one particular carrier and to have a more comprehensive approach so that the town is well covered i think is a better way to go yeah i i hope that you guys uh, seriously talk to Altis because I ran a TV station when they first took over cable vision in Southampton. And uh, you can definitely have a meeting with them. I would talk about that tower. If people aren't in agreement about the Springs uh, Firehouse cell tower, what are you waiting for? Go talk to Altice about the Salmons, the old Salmons tower, if that would help the rest of Springs. Uh, yeah, I've actually already spoken to Altice. I've already spoken to Altice, and they're preparing a, a plan to submit to the town. So, um, you know, we're waiting right. to hear back. We we certainly understand it's it's a major problem and an issue that we need to get resolved. Very good. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for taking the time to call us, Bruce. We appreciate it. Give my best to your. Take care. Yeah, to Fran. <laughs> I will. So okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Mike, do we have another caller on the line? Yes, we do. Unmuting right now. Caller, you're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Hi. Could you please state your name? Hi, Teresa McCaskey. Hi, Teresa. How are you? Hello. Oh, Hello. Okay. Very good. And yourself? Hi, can you hear me? I'm fine, thank you. Because I'm in South Hampton. Yeah, I'm in Southampton, so I'm trying not to move to a, a too much, uh, so I'm able to communicate with you. We've, I, for some reason, I'm having a very bad connection. 
So um, thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak today. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I'm calling specifically with regards to disclosure of personal information when a noise complaint is submitted. Um, on May 31st of 2020, I filed a noise complaint via the KHTO plane uh, noise app. Um, with my submission, I was under the understanding that my personal information was going to be kept private and only parties that would have access to my private information would be Robert Rotel from Plain Noise, uh, the airport manager, and possibly the East Hampton Town Board members. Um, unfortunately, this was not the case. Instead, my noise complaint, uh, which I have solid evidence uh, that it had occurred, uh, was given for analysis um, to apparently AMAC members, um, one of them being an, an FBO at the East Hampton Airport, and another one just a, a committee member. Um, it appears that upon their review, uh, I then received an email explaining um, that it was a different type of aircraft flying in my area discrediting my original complaint. Um, along with logos from Sound Aircraft, a statement that claims pilots are 100% compliant, along with a colorful plane logo, accompanying the logo that says, Save HTO, Fly Over Water. After my sending multiple emails back to this particular email address, which is, say, it says, uh, Save HTO, um, requesting that the individuals who are responsible um, for these emails um, to, um, I'm sorry, let me just back up and try to write this all down so I could say this properly. Um, after sending multiple emails back to Save HGO requesting what individuals are responsible for the email from, from the email address of Save HTO, which was copied to two other individuals uh, one of them being the airport manager and the other one being from the um, FB, representing the FBO. Uh, the response I received from the airport manager was, number one of them was, he, I, he didn't know what I was talking about. Another email stated um, recently that um, it was followed by another email that stated he deleted a lot of his emails recently. And I'm so disappointed in that response. Um, just a few days ago, after I sent um, the town board a copy of my email complaint, uh, on July 2nd, I received an email from a staff member from Sound Aircraft stating that she was assigned by AMAC to, quote, do pre-screening of data regarding some discrepancies we have noticed concerning the HTO designation of a flight that caused for a noise event from someone complaining through plain noise. Unquote. This is now another individual that has my personal information that is not an employee of East Hampton Town. I am now even more disturbed by this situation. I, I do not believe the public is aware that our personal information has been disclosed outside to outside individuals that are not East Hampton Town employees. I am asking the East Hampton Town Board to, to disband the AMAC committee and to request that the airport manager not share noise complaint submissions to any outside sources for any analyzation of noise complaints. Um, the public basically really has, should have some right um, to some privacy. I understand that some complaints may need to be analyzed in some way, you know, in some, in some fashion, but not with, the, at the, at, not with jeopardizing our, our, our name, our, our phone number, uh, and our email address. Um, so uh, that, thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's my comment for today. Thanks for calling in, Teresa. And I, I just wanna say that we were dismayed to hear that any personal information might've been shared outside of town staff uh, with regard to this. Um, and I know that I'd, I'd ask Councilman Bragman to do a follow-up and give a full explanation as to what happened. I believe he reached out to you with that. Uh, information and Jeff, do you have any comments on? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I did reach out uh, to Teresa um, and I, I talked to Jim Brundage about it as well. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it is important to protect the privacy of people that are complaining on the uh, about aircraft noise, and I think we understand that. I think Teresa, you were at the meeting, the last AMAC meeting. 
where the issue was discussed. And the, the, uh, the way this occurred is that uh, the committee wanted to uh, see if they could uh, cross-reference airport noise complaints um, to particular aircraft in an effort to see whether some complaints that we're getting related to aircraft that weren't using uh, HTO, uh, because we had heard sort of anecdotally, um, particularly with le the less, lesser amount of traffic at, at uh, East Hampton Airport, that some of the other traffic that was annoying to uh, residents and uh, people in, in neighboring communities was actually just transiting through the airspace a little more frequently because HTO was less crowded. So they wanted to explore that. And I think um, uh, your complaint uh, was one of the items of data that a couple of members of uh, the AMAC committee were gonna take a look at. Um, it shouldn't have been shared uh, outside uh, of those couple of members. And what uh, Jim Brungage explained to me is that um, the address on the complaint is, is a part of the complaint and it can't be, it's difficult to anonymize, to make, to make the complaint anonymous. Um, but I, I think actually we're, we're, we're working on that uh, so this doesn't happen again. Um, but the, um, the complaints are linked to uh, the address uh, and that, that's why your name uh, was attached to the complaint. Um, and I think um, what I can say is the, the effort to make that determination, whether there's some traffic transiting through that's causing a noise complaints and annoyance is I think a legitimate uh, question. I think it was not unreasonable for AMAC to want to uh, find out if that was the case. Uh, but uh, you know, I, 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 I regret that your complaint was handled in that way and it shouldn't have been, I think, I think someone from Steve Tuma's office was trying to be helpful, um, and it, it's it it was really not uh, it was not desirable to have anybody else looking at the data other than the members of the airport uh, advisor management advisory committee. So I've spoken to Jim and asked him if we can be sure uh, going forward if there's going to be more examination of this type of information that the complaints can be anonymized, that they, you know, the identity of the, of the uh, person making the complaint can be taken away. And I, he believes that it can be done and we'll, we'll uh, make sure that it is done. And uh, it, it's regrettable, but uh, I do wanna say that the, the task itself, I think is, uh, was a, const is a constructive idea. I, I think it's information that we might, we might wanna know, but, uh, uh, I apologize to you again for uh, 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 the upset that it caused. I can understand that. Well, thank you. And I did get your, your response email. I, I appreciate your, your responding to me, but here, here's where I stand kind of with this. Um, at that AMAC meeting, at no point in time was it ever disclosed that, our, that private information would be shared. It would be analyzation. Of course, it's understandable that um, flight tracks should be looked at, um, but at no point in time was it ever said there could be a chance or that piece or pr someone's private information is, go is going to be disclosed. That was never a topic of discussion. The topic of discussion was analyzing the route and if they, cr and, and if they apply to aircraft flying in and out of HTO. So that's one issue. And my second issue is even though that, uh, that I got this response back from Save HTO, which I have an issue with that particular email address, is number one. And number two, for the, uh, the other portion of that is for, that, for, who, for whoever is in charge of that particular email address to send it to, to me and any other individuals that is going to include uh, Sound Aircraft's phone number and, and, and then to say that pilots are 100% compliant, and then to say uh, also that some birds have returned to the area, and then to have a logo on it that says Save HTO with a plane on it, um, I think that that's all unnecessary and is not, should, I, I don't believe the town board would approve of, of all of that stuff to be forwarded as a response. 
uh, to a, a, a noise complaint. Um, a no if it's a noise complaint, you send it back with the information that, uh, that applies, and that's simply it. Uh, but instead, I got all these other attachments sent to, uh, on this email, which I believe is uncalled for. Um, and, and again, I, I will refer that I have the valid um, noise complaint uh, of the aircraft uh, that came over me, came to my area, and I will only share that with the East Hampton Board. I will not share that with the Air AMAC Committee only with the East Hampton Board because they're trying to discredit my complaint by providing it with another aircraft. Although that aircraft could have been in the area, um, that's not the one I complained about. So there is something wrong with the system that they are currently using to analyze the aircraft um, that's in question uh, with regards to my noise complaint. Um, so uh, thank you very much, though. I appreciate it. I know it's upsetting, Teresa, and, and I, do, I also know sometimes the, the um, complaint uh, system doesn't doesn't grab the correct air, uh, aircraft that you're complaining about. It can happen, um, but and I just wanted to say that you know I, I'm glad you didn't hear any discussion about disclosing personal data at the AMAC meeting because you know it was certainly would never have met with my approval. Um, and uh, you know, we regret it uh, that that your name was attached to the complaint, and we're uh, 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 Jim assures me that we can uh, have that not occur in the future. But I do know it's upsetting. Can I ask a question, Jeff? Okay. If, if AMAC believes that this is a worthwhile analysis to be done, why don't we turn it over to? Um, our consultants, the professionals, HMMH, and have them analyze the data. We can a we can ask them that when they're uh, online with us. Um, I've I've had a brief discussion with them, and it sounds like it's a pretty complicated uh, process to undertake. But we we can discuss that with them. It's it, it might it might be worth it. It might be worth doing. It's it seems like it's information worth having. I'm not sure whether. Um, I, I, I'm, I tend to think we might be getting more traffic transiting through our airspace now because the airport's not as busy as it has been. I, I think mm -hmm. during a normal busy season, people try to avoid our airspace because it's that, that busy. But we can ask MM, HMMH about it. I, I believe, if I recall correctly, they told me it could get pretty uh, involved to try to sort that out. But I'd like to hear from them further on it. Too. So, Kathy, I recall that we discussed this years ago, you know, trying that there, it does exist flyover traffic that mm -hmm. um, could cause um, complaints. So it, this isn't anything new um, as far as I'm concerned. And, and I was a little um, upset that AMAC is going off, you know, uh, not at the town board's request to do any kind of analysis, but their own request and it could be complicated as far as if they come in with information that is you know derived from uh just layman looking at things it, it it's still it's not very comforting i think to people that are looking at what is really going on at the airport mm -hmm. so i mean to have them do a job that we haven't even asked for is is uh, concerning to me well, I just want to say that we don't generally task our committees with assignments. Uh, you know, they, they're there as involved citizens and they have interests and, you know, nothing that AMAC, whatever AMAC does on its own gets passed along to the town board and uh, sometimes it gets passed along to our consultants and sometimes they you know, sometimes they find it constructive and sometimes they don't. So I, I don't see this as being a great deviation from the way the committee has always operated when, when you were co-liaison and in the years before. Mm -hmm. But again, they're not advising the board, they're doing their own work, which I think they need to advise us that they would like to do this kind of work before they go ahead and do the work. The, the, you know, well, I think that any work they, they do gets passed to, you know, they've done this before without complaint, it's fair. I think it's fairly typical for them. For example, they decided they wanted to have a subcommittee to look into um, the economics of the airport. So they don't ask permission of the town board. Can we do that? They're interested citizens, and that's an idea they had. 
But does that make it our policy? No, we passed along the their suggestions to the town board. You looked at them. We handed them over to HRNA, and uh, you know some may be accepted and some may not be. Accepted. In the, in the so interest of moving the meeting along, I'd like to see if we have any other callers on the line. And Teresa, I want to thank you for calling in. It's good to hear from you and be well. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, Mr. Supervisor, we do have another caller on the line. Just a moment, please. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Hello, caller. You're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Who's calling, please? Uh, this is Catherine Sly. Good morning, guys. Hi, Catherine. How are you all? Very well, thank you. Good. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the discussion that we were just having there, uh, particularly um, as Jeff pointed out accurately, uh, this has been a long going concern within the aviation community about uh, the complaints that are, are being filed that have absolutely nothing to do with any aircraft that are going to HTO. They have no contact with HTO. Uh, they are not landing there. They are not taking off. Um, you know, these are, these are, uh, it's been a constant problem in the complaint data that the town board uh, is, is relying upon is that there are, are multiple, almost a significant percentage of complaints that we know of, um, just like Ms. McCaskey's that were completely discredited by actual facts and definitively proven as being false as far as a complaint relating to HTO. Um, they are aircraft that are transitioning over the North Fork that have absolutely no contact with either our airspace, because remember, our airspace does not include the North Fork. Our airspace stops at about Sag Harbor. Um, so anybody flying over shelter, anybody flying over the North Fork has no contact even with our airspace. And because of that, it is a common transition route that has been a common transition route for decades. Uh, not just this year, decades. Uh, it is a transition route from Brookhaven. Uh, as you might know, Brookhaven Airport is one of the largest training airports on Long Island for student pilots. And they are all coming out of Brookhaven, head to the north, and then go along the North Fork and up and down the North Fork. Um, those aircraft have no contact with HTO. It is also a transition for ISLIP, it is a transition for Republic, and it is a transition for planes that are coming from Connecticut and other areas that are heading to areas such as Block Island or just other, other areas across uh, the Northeast. Um, all the planes going to anywhere, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, all of those will transition through the same area. Uh, and the problem that we've seen, and this has been an on, is not a new problem, this is an old problem, is that these, uh, these aircraft are being counted by certain people who live on the North Fork who file a lot of complaints, um, that they are included in the HTO numbers despite having absolutely no contact whatsoever with our airport. Um, and so uh, this is something, you know, we've pushed for a long time is to have uh, some sort of analysis done to be able to or a way to remove these complaints from the calculation, from the information, because it's basically a, a false manipulation of the complaint data to include aircraft that have no contact with our airport. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people who I think on the... Uh, the other anti-airport side, and those who want to see the airport closed, who for some reason believe that every airport that's ever flown over the entire greater New York Northeast area somehow lands and takes off at HTO, which is not correct. Um, so I, you know, I just want to reiterate, I do believe HMMH should step in and should perform some analysis or, or be involved in a way to be able to remove these complaints so that we have a more accurate picture as opposed to a skewed and, and potentially you know, manipulated picture of what the actual complaints are regarding aircraft at our airport. Um, so I guess my, my main point is if I would just ask the town board to really consider seriously having HMMH um, or an, one of its consultants take a look at this so that we're not using uh, erroneous data to make any decisions at this point because that, that's not helping anybody by using falsified or erroneous data uh, that no one should consider that kind of information. Yeah, I don't know that it would be falsified, but it, but uh, I do understand uh, the comment that not every aircraft that flies uh, over our airspace or near our airspace is necessarily associated with H2O. And I think it's important for us to have the most uh, representative uh, information possible so that we can make the decisions going forward. So I appreciate you taking the time to call us, Catherine. 
and uh, be well. Okay. Um, yeah, great. Like I said, if we can just, you know, if we can, I can put it out there that, you know, I think Jeff has looked into it as well as if we can have HMMH do that, I think we'd like to have a more accurate picture if possible. So, great. Thank you, guys. appreciate your time. Thank you. Michael, do we have any other callers on the line? Yes, there are two callers. One moment. Unmuting the first one. Hello, caller. You're live with the town board of East Hampton. Could you state your name? Hello, caller. Are you there? Hearing nothing, Mr. Supervisor, move on to the last one. Hello, caller. You're live with the town board of East Hampton. Can you please state your name? Yes, hi, good morning. This is John Corain. I live in Sag Harbor. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all for giving uh, me to this, speak with you this morning uh, to reiterate the concerns of your neighbors on the Southampton Town side of the line uh, who continue to be plagued by all sorts of aircraft noise, loud and low, uh, from early morning to late in the evening. Uh, I, I know that there was a, uh, a sincere effort made to change the routes this year to try to mitigate some of the noise. Uh, I will tell you, and I shared this at the AMAC meeting, and if you weren't at the AMAC meeting, you may have read it in some of the local papers, that my view of it has been a, uh, a failure. It has done nothing to make life better for us over here in the Sag Harbor, Noyak, North, uh, North Sea, Hampton Bays areas. Uh, and and I, I just want you to know that uh, we are appreciative of the town board's efforts to try to get control of the airport. Uh, I think here in uh, my neighborhood, I think we've come to the conclusion that the only long-term solution is going to be closing that airport. And um, because it's just a landlocked airport with the kind of volume that East Hampton has, uh, it's just going to move problems from one community to the other by trying to shift routes. So that's all I have to say. Again, most, uh, most important is just to thank you all for your efforts. I know this is a difficult task. But uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that you'll come to the right conclusion. John, thanks so much for taking the time to call us and give us your comments. Appreciate that. Michael, do we have any other callers on the line? No, there are no more callers on the line. Okay. Um, if anyone has tried calling and for some reason couldn't get through, please try calling back again and we'll try to get to you as soon as we can. But I would like to move forward and get started with our first topic, which is the air traffic review for 2019 presented by HMMH, our consultant. They have a PowerPoint presentation to uh, put forth. Uh, yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can uh, can you all hear me and uh, see me? Yes, Adam. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. I'm Schultz with HMMH. Here we go. Um, and just um, confirm that you guys can see the presentation. It looks like it here on on the meeting, but just want to make sure. It's coming through quite clear for me. Okay. I believe it's up on the screen. All right. Um, so I will uh, get started. My name is Adam Scholten. Um I'm a senior consultant at HMMH, and Mary Allen Egan, who's the president and um, chairman of the board for HMMH, is also um, on the call here with, with me. And um, today I'm going to be presenting the analysis of operations and complaints that occurred at the East Hampton Airport um, during the implementation period, which is it's not a full year. Um, it's a period that is based on when restrictions were put into place originally in 2015 and 2016 at the airport in terms of curfews, um, you know, and extended curfews for when certain types of aircraft could operate. Um, and HMMH has been doing this analysis for, for many years for the town. Um, and today we're going to look back all the way to 2015, which is the first year when those um, restrictions were put into place. So it's a five year um, analysis period. And, and this period is generally the, the period of time when the airport has the highest number of operations during the summertime. Um, you know, as, as many of you know, the, the airport has a very seasonal mix of operations, and normally those operations are much higher during the summer than during the other months. And this, this period of time aligns well both with looking at how operations have changed over time with the restrictions being in place and then not being in place, and then also um, you know, just the general picture of seasonally, you know, each year during the busy period, how operations and, and complaints have changed at the airport. 
Um, so what we're going to go through first and in, in going through the presentation, I'll go over how we do the analysis. Um, this is kind of just a review. It's pretty much the same way we've done it previous years. Um, then we'll look first at operations that occurred during the 2019 implementation period um, and how those compare to previous years going all the way back to, to 2015 over that time, same time period. Um, then we'll look at complaints and how those compare over those same periods of time. Um, we'll also do take a look at how the operations and complaints um, correlate a little bit um, through those periods, and then we'll have some general discussion um, at the end. Um, I will say that, you know, if, if there are any burning questions that come up as I'm, I'm presenting on a particular item or slide, um, you know, feel, feel free to ask questions at that time. Um, but generally, I'd like to hold questions to the end. But again, if, if there is something that j jumps out at, at, at any of you that you'd like to, to make a comment on or discuss further, we can do that at, at that time. Um, so, as I, I mentioned, starting out with the analysis overview, um, you know, what the analysis is based on the most recently available complaint operations data that we have that, that contains in a full implementation period, which would be um, for the summer of 2019, as 2020 is in progress right now. And that period is June 27th, 2019 to September 30th, 2019. How that period is defined is based on the, um, it was the, the Thursday before July 4th to September 30th for given summer season or given year. Um, and, and that correlates to the period in 2015 and 2016 when, I mean, the, the restrictions were first put in place in 2015 and correlated to being fully in place um, on that Thursday before the 4th of July through September 30th. And then that time period varies by a day or two each year, um, just depending on when the 4th of July falls. Um, but that, you know, that is a baseline that, that we've used for you know, the past five years to, to kind of evaluate how operations and complaints have, have trended at the East Hampton Airport. Um, and we collect the data from a few different sources. Um, the operations data is collected from the Vector Noise and Operations Management System, or VNOMS, um, which is a system used at the airport to track aircraft operations. It has a, a series of cameras on the airport that, that capture information on the number of operations and also um, you know, who the operations are in terms of the type of aircraft um, and who the operator is. Um, so that's one piece of data, and that's where we get the data for, for operations. And then for the complaint data, there's a few different sources of data we use um, to analyze. And one of those is the plane noise system, which is maintained by the airport um, and is, is commercially, you know, purchased by the airport for use of the service. Um, and also within that plane noise system, there, there's also new this year, there's a system called Air Noise IO um, that began to be used this year that, that feeds complaints it's separate from plane noise, but it actually feeds the complaints to plane noise so then the town can receive them um, through that system. And then there's also a system called Air Noise Report. Um, which has been in operation for a few years now, and that's separate from, you know, being maintained by the town. That's actually maintained by an individual um, who lives in um, Brooklyn that um, is concerned about helicopter and airplane noise, and he's made the system available out to residents out on the east end of uh, Long Island and, and has a certain area of which he collects complaints associated with that. Um, but and, and we'll, I'll get into a little bit more of the intricacies of both systems when we get into the review of the, the complaints. Um, but you know, we, we synthesize all those data sources and have for pre many other years previously um, to, to get the total picture of the complaints um, you know, that are out on the east end um, that are recorded by both systems. Um, and again, th this is consistent with what we've done with prior years. The one new wrinkle is that the Air Noise I.O. system came online um, during the 2019 implementation period, and we wanted to make sure that those complaints got counted as well. Um, and, you know, we're going to look at these operations and complaints and see how they compare to, to previous implementation periods. So moving forward, um, looking at the implementation period operations from a high level, 
Um, looking at 2019 versus 2018, um, looking at operations, overall activity increased by about 1,500 operate or 1,400 to 1,500 operations at 8%. Um, and within that, that in that 8% increase, breaking it down further by the different types of aircraft that that operated East Hampton, um, the helicopters increased by 7%. Um, relative to 2018 or 377 operations. Um, the land plane activity increased by 687 operations or also about 7%. Now this is relative to seaplanes and helicopters in 2018, not the, not the overall total. That's the, where the 8% comes from. But these are within each of the categories relative to the previous year. Um, seaplane activity increased by 500 operations or 23%. Um, an undefined activity decreased by 92 operations or, or 16%. And one thing that should be known about undefined activity, those are operations where an operation was recorded at the East Hampton Airport by the VNOM system, but there wasn't a specific aircraft registration or type associated with it. Um, so the system recorded that there was an operation, but it just it wasn't sure how many of those or, or what that operation was. And it's, it's a very small number. 92, um, you know, the, the number decreasing by 92, and we'll get into the totals here in a moment. Um, but it's the, the undefined activity, very small number of operations relative to the total that occur at East Hampton. Um, and what you'll see, and we'll go through this in the next slides that follow the graphically show, you know, not only how the operations have changed over the last few years in terms of the overall numbers, but also when the aircraft have operated in terms of the hours of the day. Um, or night. Um, what, what we've seen in 2019 is that the operations continue to follow patterns from 2018 and 2017, um, which is, you know, all these years there were not, the curfews were no longer in effect that were implemented in 2015 because they were struck down in November of 2016 um, by the U.S. Pellet Corp. But the, that basically they continue to deviate from the intent of those curfew restrictions that were put into place. And that being that that operations are continuing to shift overall toward the nighttime curfew hours that were established, both the baseline and extended curfew. And then aircraft that are considered as noisy, which are aircraft that have a, a noise certification level of 91 um, decibels perceived noise level on approach, which is, you know, going back to uh, prior to 2015, the town looking at establishing um, a, you know, a line in terms of, or a, a noise level is what's considered noisy and not. Um, you know, those noisy aircraft operations, they continue to shift out of the hours during the day and into the hours that previously were considered part of the nighttime and extended curfew because the restrictions are no longer in place. Um, and we'll also go through this again, but high level looking at 2019 and 2015, you know, over these past five years, um, operations have generally increased overall by 23%, with the biggest operation, biggest increases in occurring um, in helicopters at 56%, and then um, also seaplanes at 40%, and then um, land planes did increase by about 11%, looking at 2019 versus 2015, and then undefined activities actually decreased by about 43%. Um, one item to note about that is that, you know, over time, the, the vector system at the airport, you know, has been continually tweaked every year and technology is always improving. So, um, you know, part of the reason of that decrease in the undefined activity is just that the fact that the, the, the vector system has gotten better and better at, at you know, including and in, in identifying the operations op at, at the East Hampton Airport. Um, you know, and again, as I noted, that the overall operations, the biggest increases have been among the helicopter and the seaplane. Um, so I think, you know, those were high level looking at the numbers. I think that these slides better, um, you know, visualize as to what's changed over time. So looking at these slides, you'll, you'll see there's each of the years of the implementation period. Um, and then within each of those years, the operations are separated out by color um, to show you know, the number of operations that occurred within each aircraft category, which is by color, so helicopter, land plane, seaplane, undefined, um, 
you know, or multiple of which there, there weren't any. The multiple is more for the complaints, but to, to remain consistent between looking at operations and complaints, they're included. Um, you know, so you can see the relative number and also kind of get an idea of how many percent of the total operations each one of those categories represented. In looking, you know, from 2015 to 2019, um, you know, the operations in general have increased overall, um, while there was, you know, between 2015 and 2016, which are the years that the curfews um, and um, restrictions were in place, their operations were relatively steady. Then they increased in 2017, decreased, you know, slightly in 2018, but have since rebounded in 2019 above um, the 2017 and 2018 operations levels. In looking, you know, at the overall percentage of the fleet, you can see over time, you know, looking at 2015 going on to, to 2019, um, you know, the percentage of helicopters has gone up from 25% to about 32%. And, and it's fluctuated a little bit each year, you know, it's, it's gone down and up a little bit, but in general, overall, looking over that time, it's, it's gone up. Um, you know, in terms of the percentage of operations and also looking at, at seaplanes, um, you know, similarly, looking overall from 2015 to 2019, that those operations have also gone up as well. But, you know, each year the percentage of the fleet fluctuates a little bit, um, you know, at the airport over those times. Um, so that's looking high level at overall operations. Looking next is at how the operations stack up in terms of what time of day they operated. Um, and this is where it's really important because you have, this is where the restrictions in 2015 and 2016 really come into play in terms of the hours at which aircraft could operate, of which there was a, a baseline curfew in 2015 and 16 from 11 to 7 a.m. and then an extended curfew for those noisy aircraft it went from 7 to 9 a.m. and then also from 8 to 11 p.m. Um, and you can see each of these years is color coded, um, but you can see really in, in 2015 and 2016, there wasn't a lot of operations or you know, very few that occurred during those nighttime curfew hours. Um, and this is looking at all the operations. I, I, we're gonna look at the difference between the noisy and, and other operations in a couple slides, but overall, you know, there really wasn't a lot of operations that occurred during those those baseline nighttime curfew hours. Um, and, and starting in 2017, which is the first implementation period that the curfews weren't in effect, you can see that those operations shift into those baseline nighttime curfew hours. Um, you can also see, too, that the, num the overall number of operations that occurred during extended curfew hours, which, you know, we're showing all operations here. So those extended curfew hours didn't apply to some of the operations that are that are being shown in the slide. Um, but, you know, they did, the operations did also shift into those extended curfew hours as well. Um, so you can kind of see with the, you know, with the relaxing or the removal of the restrictions that the operations did shift back into those time periods when, which they, which they were designed to, to um, stop aircraft operations. Um, so breaking this out further, looking at the noisy aircraft operations, and this is on average per week of the implementation period, um, which the other slide showed as well. Um, you know, really you can see, you know, specifically looking at the, you know, not only the, the, the kind of slate shaded area and also the beige slated area on the slide, which shows both the nighttime and extended curfew hours. Um, you, you can really see that you know, in 2015 and 2016, going through that whole baseline and extended nighttime curfew period, you know, there really weren't a lot of noisy aircraft operations that occurred, you know, before 9 a.m. or um, after 8 p.m. But after the restrictions were relaxed or, you know, removed in 2015 and 2016, those operations, you can see in 27, 18, and 19 have now shifted back into those hours that, that previously were part of the baseline nighttime and extended curfew for noisy aircraft. Um, and similarly for the baseline aircraft or for other aircraft that were not considered noisy, um, you know, again, you can see when the curfews were in effect, you know, the baseline curfew, there, there weren't a lot of operations that occurred, you know, hardly any before 
um, you know, 7 a.m. in the morning or, or after 10 p.m. at night. But when the curfews were removed, um, you know, there, there was an uptick in those operations, specifically at the hours, you know, at the 6 a.m. hour and 11 p.m. hour, um, you know, relative to what was in effect when, when the curfews were in place. So, what, you know, what this data shows is over the five-year period, um, you know, after the curfews were, were struck down in, in 2016, the operations in prior years have, or pre in previous years after that, have shifted out back into those curfew hours, whether that be the extended curfew for noisy aircraft or the baseline curfew for, for all the other aircraft. Um, and, and we kind of talked about this earlier at, at a high level at the other, on the other slides. Um, and we'll revisit that slide again that visualizes the, you know, the percentage of the fleet that's operating at East Hampton. So what percentage of operations in a given year are attributed to, of the total are attributed to helicopters versus seaplanes and, and otherwise. Um, you know, looking at, at aircraft operations as a percentage of the fleet, um, you know, in 2019, the, in the 2019 implementation period, land planes were the biggest percentage of aircraft that were in the East Hampton fleet at 52%, followed by helicopters at 32%, seaplanes at 14%, and then undefined aircraft at, at 3%, which again, as I mentioned, is not really a large number of operations. And, you know, each year the vector system has gotten better and better at, at, at unflagging those, un, or, you know, removing identifying what those operations are. Um, and looking at 2018, you know, there really weren't a lot of big changes in terms of the, the percentage of operations, um, you know, as, as an amount of the total. The land planes basically remained constant. Um, helicopters decreased by less than 1% in terms of the overall percentage of the fleet. The seaplanes increased by 2% and undefined aircraft decreased by a percent. Um, so really, looking back to 2018, the, the percentages of aircraft, different categories of aircraft operating in East Hampton in terms of the total percentage of the fleet, they, they remain basically the same. Um, but looking back between 2019 and 2015, um, you know, there were some changes in, that, in, in those being that versus, you know, 2019 looking all the way back to 2015, the number of land planes in the fleet decreased by 5%. Where in that, you know, that 5%, um, you know, shifted more toward helicopters and seaplanes with helicopters increasing by 7%, seaplanes by 2%, and then also, you know, undefined aircraft, you know, those decreased by 3%. So what happened is, you know, really the, the percentage of the operations in the fleet mix shifted away from the land planes, um, you know, so a greater percentage of operations shifted more toward occurring from helicopters and seaplanes as opposed to land planes. And also with the improved ability of the vector system to identify operations, you know, those 3% that were under identified, you know, got attributed to either, you know, seaplane, land plane, helicopter, or so on. Um, and again, this is the same slide we showed earlier, but this also shows the, the percentage of operations in the fleet um, compared to the total. Um, and you can just see the trends, you know, year over year is, you know, as I noted earlier, you know, really the percentage of helicopters has increased since 2015 and, and seaplanes really also where, you know, land planes has, has decreased and also the undefined aircraft has decreased as a percentage of the, the overall fleet. So, um, moving on, we're going to go in to look at the, the complaints next, and I guess this is a good spot to probably just stop and make sure that you guys don't have any questions or anything at this point or, um, you know, if before I move on to going into the complaint data. Any questions for Adam? Okay, Adam, I think we're good to continue. Okay. All right, so looking now, that we looked at operations, so now we're going to look at complaints. Um, again, looking at those same time periods from 2015 to 2019, that implementation period when the, the curfews were in effect and, and also where operations have traditionally been the highest at the airport. Um, you know, so for the complaint analysis, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, it, 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 it's a synthesis of, of three different data sources for the complaint data. Um, the first of which being the plane noise system 
which the town um, has been under contract with uh, Plain Noise and, and Robert Grotel since 2012 to, to um, use the system for the airport. And it's a commercially available product um, that's used by a large number of airports in the United States for complaint management and tracking of complaints. Um, all the complaints in the Plain Noise system are address-based meaning that you, when you file a complaint, you have to provide some kind of address information and your name, phone number, and that sort of, of information. What I, I will note about that is that, um, you know, those, that data does come in with the complaints through plain noise. We um, do not look at the address information or the phone numbers. Um, what we do is, is included in those complaints um, the latitude and longitude of the address is provided, and that's all we use for, for doing our complaint analysis. Um, you know, we don't go and look at the people's emails or personal information associated with that. We, we scrub that out when we do the analysis. So I, I just want to point that out. You know, we don't go through and look at individual names and stuff when we do this. We, anon we anonymize the complaints we receive from plain noise and just focus on the, the location that's provided by the system, but not the actual address or personal information. Um, and the, the complaint system not only tracks complaints associated with East Hampton, but also the Montauk Airport. There is the ability when you file a complaint to go in um, and attribute a complaint to either airport, um, but it's on the user who is filing the complaints to, to say which airport they think a complaint is associated with or should be associated with. Um, and it utilizes a whole bunch of different methods to file complaints. I, I have the airport noise complaint form on the slide here, um, which is the web form, but it also allows you to, to submit complaints via email. You can fax complaints in. There's a mobile app you can use, um, and you can use a hotline. You can call up and, and file a complaint as well if, if you don't want to use any of the other sources. Um, Plain Noise also, new this year, began accepting complaints from a separate system called Air Noise IO, um, which I'll describe in a little bit. Um, but basically that system sends its complaint to Plain Noise in a format that's compatible with the system, and then Plain Noise includes it in its complaints that it, it are tracked for the town. Um, so Plain Noise is actually also accepting complaints from this other Air Noise IO system. Um, and it's important to note that Air Noise, the Air Noise IO system didn't begin submitting complaints to plain noise until July 23rd of 2019. So in, in, in previous years, those there were none of those complaints, but those are now appearing in the town's complaint system. Um, and we included them this year because you know it was during the period of time that we were analyzing. Um, and just one thing to note, there were 43 complaints associated with Montauk um, during the 2019 summer implementation period. That's pretty consistent with other years. There's normally you know, 50 or, or less complaints that, that end up coming in associated with Montauk. Um, but they are in the analysis here. But just so you know, so everyone knows that there are a few complaints from Montauk in our analysis. Um, so kind of moving on from plain noise and, and it is the air noise IO system, which again, this, this system is new. It started submitting complaints in, on July 23rd of 2019. It's actually a separate complaint system that then sends its complaints to Plain Noise and Plain Noise accepts them. Um, Air Noise AO is also used at many airports across the country. It allows you know users to file complaints. The, the difference is it's it's not a commercially available product that's available for airport operators to use. Um, instead, it's a commercially available product that's available for users or people who want to file complaints to use. Um, and it, it's, this system is not maintained by the town, it, although it does feed complaints to plain noise, which is maintained by the town. Um, the big difference with this system versus plain noise um, is that you have to have an account to file complaints. Um, and if you want to file a large number of complaints, more than about 30 a month, um, or if you want to use this complaint button, which I'll describe in a moment, there, there is a monthly subscription fee that you have to pay if you want to use the system to file your complaint. So that, that's something that's kind of important is that it's not really free unless you're only going to file less than 30 complaints a month. Um, and it sort supports the use. It has a web portal, 
has an SMS function, and there's also a complaint button, which is essentially it's similar to one of those Amazon Dash buttons that um, when you have an account, you can use the Amazon Dash button and just press the button. And what it will do is it will actually look using ADSB technology, which is um, you know part of NextGen and it's a satellite-based system that tracks where aircraft are located. Um, starting in 2020, you know, pretty much every aircraft had to be equipped with ADSB, with some exceptions. Um, you know, if you're not going to fly in certain air airspace, you don't have to be ADSB equipped, but most aircraft generally are. Um, but it uses, it taps into that data source um, from the FAA, and if possible, it looks to find an aircraft near where the person is complaining, um, you know, based on their account that they set up when they press the button. And then, you know, it, it correlates that complaint or that aircraft operation to, um, you know, the complaint that's being filed. So it'll include information on the aircraft and where it is and, um, you know, altitude and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, then that, that gets submitted to the plane noise complaint portal um, included with the complaint. And, you know, again, we, we analyze this data as part of our analysis for, for the 2019 implementation period. And, and this is new this year. This was a, um, you know, the system was not operational prior to the 2019 implementation period. So, Adam, it's Kathy. Who's behind Air Noise IO? Uh, it is a resident of San Diego who was concerned about aircraft noise in, in San Diego and didn't like uh, airport authorities way of filing complaints and thought there was a better way to do it and, and he's actually a software engineer himself um so he developed this own his own complaint system and then um over time he has then since you know originally it was just for san diego but over time he has expanded that out to many many airports across the country um and adapted the system to work with you know whatever airport operator is um, you know, whatever complaint system they're using. So, you know, it's, it's been put into use, um, you know, for example, in, in Baltimore and in Chicago and, and lots of other major airports across the United States. And um, part of that has been, I mean, he's kind of rolled that out on his own at some of these airports. And some of these airports, it's been a case of a resident reaching out to him and saying, you know, we really, your complaint system seems really interesting to us. We would like to use it as opposed to using, you know, the, the airport sponsored complaint system. Um, you know, can you adapt the system for us to use it here? And he's done that in some cases. So, um, with, with in terms of East Hampton, I, I would assume that is probably what happened is that a resident, you know, might have contacted him and said, We would like to use your system. Um, you know, would you be willing to roll that out? And, you know, he, he likely. Did that then and I mean he taps into publicly available data sources from the FAA in terms of the you know that that, that location data is available so um, you know he, he's able to to tap into those sources to to get the aircraft location and data and that sort of thing so um, you know he it's again it's not something he does not sell the system to airport operators it's it's only generally community members that he allows to use it and um, you know, and, and you do have to normally as a community member, like if you want to use the, the button, the, the um, button that he's created to file a complaint or you want to file a certain number of complaints a month, you, you have to pay a subscription fee. So it's not it's not necessarily free. And, and it dovetails with plain noise so that it's populating the same databases and giving you the same latitude and longitude as, data, as plain noise does? Correct. Yeah. He, he is, he adapts his, how he submits the complaints are adapted to whatever system is at use at the airport. And he, um, you know, the, the air noise IO system is, has been adapted to submit complaints to plain noise and plain noise has, has been receiving them. So, so plain noise has been doing it throughout the country, wherever they're, they have a, a system in place. Correct. As, as long as, um, air noise IO has, you know, adapted their complaints to match, the, the, the format of the, because each airport has a little bit different complaint forms in terms of how they, you know, have it set up. But mm -hmm. as long as he's adapted it to match, plain noise will, will accept those complaints. 
And was that information broken out separately? I know you, in, in a later slide, you talk about, you know, a third of the complaints came through plane noise, and then 7% of those were air noise IO. Do you know which ones were air noise IO, or is it all married by the time it gets to you? Um, well, it, it's all married by the time it gets to, to me because plane noise exports the complaints out of their system. Um, so, but he, it is noted in the, the plane noise system which data source the complaint came from, and it will be flagged as being air noise IO versus one of the other different methods that, that plane noise supports, such as the hotline or webmail um, or so on. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and then the last complaint system that, that we use. Oh, go yeah. ahead. Sorry. Are there redundancies between the two, or is that taken care of in um, what you, you referred to as marrying the data? Um, there is a, I mean, there is a chance that someone could go into plain noise, file a complaint at the exact same time as the one they press their the button and, and filed using Air Noise I.O. Um, so there is a chance that you could have two complaints for the same operation in the data set. Um, I would just say I'd find that kind of unlikely because the amount of time it would take for you to fill out the plain noise complaint form versus press the Air Noise I.O. button. It's, I mean, the Air Noise I.O. button is literally instantaneous. So it goes right through at that time. Um, but it, there, is a, there is a chance that they could be the same, associated with the same operation. Um, you know, and, and the way we, you know, you could tease that out is by looking at, um, you know, the time that the complaint was filed and the location of the, the latitude and longitude of the address that the, where the complaint was filed. Um, so that there is kind of a chance that you could have duplicates in there. Um, but I, I don't, wouldn't be too confident that there's too many cases of that. And we haven't seen that at a lot of other airports where it's generally if someone starts using the air noise IO system, they stick to using that one system and okay. don't go in and in. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then the last system that, that we use for analyzing the complaints is air noise report. Um, and that's a system that became operational in, in late June of 2016. Um, and since then, we've used the complaints in our analysis. And it's, uh, it's again, this is a system that's maintained by a resident um, in Brooklyn who's com concerned about helicopter and aircraft noise. And he created the system, um, you know, more for, for tracking helicopter and aircraft activity in Manhattan. But it, it since, you know, a, a resident contacted him and asked if the system could be used out on the east end. Um, and he adapted the system to then be used out on the east end. And it uses, has two different ways complaints can be filed. Um, one way is using ADSB, similar to Air Noise IO, which is a, a publicly available data feed and also MODAS, um, which is a form of legacy um, radar technology, but it allows you to identify a specific aircraft operation. Um, and those are known as mapped complaints. And what you can do is there's a web portal and you can go on the web portal and, you know, it will show where aircraft are on the east end um, within a certain area. Um, and then you can click on that aircraft and submit a complaint. Um, and what it will do when you do that is it, sits a com it submits the complaint with the location of where the aircraft was at the time the user submitted the complaint, but it doesn't include any information on the person's address um, or any personal information about that, that about who is complaining about that aircraft. Um, another thing that's important to note, too, with Air Noise Report is it filters out, um, you know, most operations that are occurring at high altitudes, so above, mainly above 3,000 feet, it doesn't, you know, so operations that are going into JFK or, um, you know, into ISLEP or, um, you know, other major airports, it, it, it filters most of those operations out unless it goes down below, you know, 3,000 feet. But it doesn't necessarily say that, it doesn't filter operations out in terms of whether or not they're going into or out of East Hampton. Um, you know, basically, if it falls within the bounding box that's, that's shown on the slide to the right, um, you know, and someone decides to complain about that aircraft, you know, as long as they're at those lower altitudes, it's, it's going to submit a complaint associated with that. 
Um, so that's one way that you can file complaints in air noise report. Another way, similar to plain noise, is that um, there are manual or address-based complaints where an individual, if they don't see an aircraft operating on, you know, the, the web map or, you know, maybe the web map application's down, um, you know, an individual can enter their personal information and report on the type of complaint that their operation or operation that they're complaining about in generic terms, you know, whether it's a seaplane, helicopter, you know, large or small airplane, they can submit that data. And, and again, this data, even though the individual submits address information, that those complaints, when they're transmitted to us, um, which, which they're transmitted to us directly from the operator, who again is, the, is a, you know, a, a citizen in, in Brooklyn, um, you know, the, he doesn't sell the system to the to airports or, you know, he doesn't profit off of the system in any way because he doesn't charge u- users to use it. Um, he then, you know, he determines the latitude and longitude of the location where the person's filing a complaint, but it then scrubs out any information about the actual individual who, who filed the complaint, including, you know, name, address, email, phone number, any of that. So when we see the complaints, all we see is just the latitude and longitude of, an ind- of the address that where the complaint was filed, but we don't actually see the address that um, is included in the complaint when the person filed it. So we sent, we, you know, I think it's important to go over these systems, even though we've used them year after year, just because, you know, we, we then take it and then we synthesize all that data to do the analysis. Um, and it's just one important thing to note is that as we take these complaint data in, um, you know, how they categorize complaints isn't necessarily consistent between each one of the systems. Um, so this slide is just kind of showing how we take the data, how it's categorized, and then kind of how we, um, you know, go through and break it out into the different types that are that are shown in the analysis. Um, and um, you know, how we get them to synthesize to be consistent between the three data sources. Adam, can I ask a question again? So have we yeah. always used the one homogeneous group land planes? I thought in years past we broke it out. Jets were separate from like turbo and piston. There, there were in the case, there were times in the past where we did do that. Um, but it's kind of varied the last, at least the last three years predominantly, we've broken it into these other groups, um, mainly because of trying to harmonize the plane noise complaints with the air noise, or sorry, with the air noise report complaints. Um, because like air noise report, specifically the mapped complaints, we can pull out, we can determine if it's a jet versus not a jet, for example, because those map complaints are based on aircraft registration data. So we know, you know, this registration, it's, it's registered to the FAA as this aircraft type. But the plain noise complaints, um, you know, depending on how it's filed, they aren't registration based. So sometimes, you know, we don't know if it's a JET or not, or if it's a manual complaint from Air Noise Report, they don't have a JET category in there and there's no registration data. Um, so we did that to harmonize, kind of harmonize these together and also allow us to do comparisons also to the operations data in the VNOM system. Um, so, I mean, we do have the ability to pull out for certain complaint types, drill down further if it's a jet or a turboprop, um, you know, or, you know, a noisy jet versus a non-noisy jet or noisy helicopter versus non-noisy helicopter. But to synthesize all the complaint data together, um, we've used these these broader categories because it allows us to, you know, put everything into one bucket and basically say, you know, with the helicopters, land planes, seaplanes, and, um, you know, unknown and multiple, basically, to, to match those together and then marry those together with the vector system. But we do have the ability for some complaint types to go down further, and, and we could break that out looking at jets and turboprops and that sort of thing. Okay. Because there's a big difference in probably the noise signature of, say, a jet or one of the larger jets and a piston, you know, aircraft and things like that. Right. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. So moving into the, the top level complaints, looking at 
it, 2019 versus the 2018 implementation period, the complaints did increase overall by quite a bit, by 33%. Um, and then looking at complaints within each category of aircraft um, versus 2018. So within the helicopter category, relative to 2018 helicopter complaints, they increased by 31%. Um, land plane complaints increased by 17%. Seaplane complaints increased by 97%. Um, multiple airplane complaints increased by 218%. And then um, one thing to note about the multiple complaints and, and also with undefined aircraft, there aren't a lot of those complaints. So that, that large increase percentage-wise is kind of skewed because if, if you don't have a lot of complaints to begin with and you increase them you know, by a small amount, you're gonna have a larger number anyway in terms of within that category. So just, just one thing to caveat there. Um, you know, and the undefined aircraft complaints decreased by 18%. And, and one thing to note about the undefined complaints is, you know, with each year, um, you know, especially too with Air Noise Report and Air Noise IO, um, you know, those systems, because they use ADSB each year, you know, more and more aircraft are getting more better equipped with ADSB and, and transmitting that information, which allows more accurate identification of the aircraft associated with those location or aircraft-based complaints. Um, you know, an ADSB became mandatory for most types of operations in 2020. Again, there are some exclusions that, you know, if you're not going to operate in certain types of airspace, you don't have to have ADSB. But but most aircraft have, have been equipping with ADSB and over time, and you know, that trend is pretty consistent that, you know, over time that the, being able to identify what type of aircraft people are complaining about, that's improved. Um, you know, as we've gone through the analysis. Um, and looking, so that's looking, that was looking back at 2019 versus the 2018 implementation period, looking all the way back to 2015 overall, I mean, complaints have, have increased by quite a bit since 2015, um, you know, with overall complaints going up by 145% relative to 2015. And then, you know, within the various categories, the biggest increases, um, you know, in helicopters at 122%, land planes at 154%, seaplanes, you know, it, the most overall at 430%. Again, this is relative to within that category in 2015. And then, you know, the undefined complaints decreasing over that time, which, which again, a lot of that can be contributed to increased equipage with ADSB, um, you know, and better aircraft identification data. Um, and really the, the big observation is, you know, with operations, you know, also, but looking at complaints, you know, they've increased overall between 2019 and or from 2015 to 2019. And the biggest increases have, have been, you know, overall really between the, you know, the helicopters and seaplanes, although land planes did increase also quite a bit. And similar to operations, this is, you know, showing the data in the same way, but in terms of looking at um, looking at complaints, um, again, they're all, the, the complaint, the aircraft type of which a complaint was filed is color-coded here and then shows the overall totals and then the percentages of complaints um, within each group. You can see, you know, looking at, at helicopters, um, you know, it's kind of looking at the, um, or sorry, looking at the overall numbers of complaints. We'll get more into the fleet next a little bit later, but, you know, just overall the complaints you know, they increased a little bit from 2015 to 2016 when curfews were in effect, and then when the curfews were removed, um, you know, in 2017, the complaints really spiked um, up to about 46,000. They did decrease a little bit in 2018, but in 2019, they rebounded and then exceeded the, the levels that were in 2017 and in 2018. And then looking at terms of the percentage of the fleet mix, um, the most complained about category of aircraft in terms of the per, you know the percentage of overall operations at East or overall complaints at, at East Hampton, um, you know, was helicopters with them consisting of about 53% of the complaints, where land planes were the second largest category at 26%, seaplanes at 18%, and then the multiple and undefined complaints representing the remaining 3%. 
in of complaints and compared to 2018, um, you know, the complaints about helicopters decreased by about a percent and land planes decreased by about 4%, but the percentage of complaints about um, seaplanes actually increased by 6% and about undefined and multiple aircraft also decreased by about a percent. So what, what that says is that in 2019 versus 2018, um, complaints in terms of the percentage of the fleet mix, they shifted more to being about seaplanes um, in a way from the other uh, operational types. In looking at um, 2019 versus 2015, going all the way back, um, actually, the, the overall percentage of complaints about helicopters has decreased by about 6%, um, and then has increased with land planes by about 1%, but about seaplanes by 10%, um, and has also decreased by undefined and multiple aircraft by about 5%. And, and what that really is showing is that the complaints have really shifted more toward operations associated with seaplanes over that time um, versus other types. And they've shifted away, um, you know, from helicopters and multiple and undefined aircraft. But it, where they've really kind of shifted is away from the helicopters and more toward the seaplanes. And that is consistent with the fact that, you know, looking at operations, seaplane operations have increased over that time also. Um, and then this slide, again, this is revisiting it. We looked at this a few slides ago, but... Um, you know, it, it, this slide just looks at those percentages that we just spoke about and the, the breakout of kind of how they varied from year to year, um, you know, and how the complaints, again, have really kind of shifted away, you know, a little bit, you know, from the helicopters and more toward the seaplanes and a little bit um, toward land planes. And, and as part of this analysis that we're going to go into next, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, is that you know, there are only some complaints that, that, that are received from these various systems, you know, air noise IO, plane noise, and air noise report that include address and household information. And again, that address and household information that we use is just latitude and longitude of the address. We don't actually look at the personal information associated with that, that location. Um, but only some of the complaints that are received from these systems contain that address and household information. All the complaints received from plane noise, which include also the ones received from air noise IO, they include address, latitude, and longitude. And again, it's anonymized in terms of the fact that, you know, while, you know, the data we get does include address, personal information, we delete all that out when we, we, we do our analysis. So we just look at latitude and longitude. Um, so those plane noise complaints include address information in report complaints that are filed through air noise report manually, meaning that you use their web form. You can't, you don't click on an aircraft on the map. Um, you just file complaints based on, you, you know, you input your address and then it spits out a latitude and longitude associated with that. Those contain address. Um, and we can assume that those are associated with a household where someone lives. But the other complaints from air noise report, those map complaints where you click on an aircraft, the, the, the position that's provided in those complaints is the latitude and longitude of the aircraft location when the complaint was filed. It doesn't include any information on who was filing the complaint or where that person was located when the complaint was filed. So those complaints, we don't know, you know, it's based on where an aircraft was at that time. So we can't definitively say who filed that complaint and it could have been one person that filed that complaint. Um, it could have been multiple people that, you know, clicked on that same aircraft at different times and filed a complaint on that. Um, you know, so we can't say for sure that that, you know, what, what resident or how many residents filed complaints on, you know, using the air noise report mapped complaint interface. Well, Adam, so, was, Adam, this is David Lee. That was one of my questions about the uniqueness of every complaint specifically to each operation. So we can't actually mine that data, that's what you're stating there. We can't pull out per so each operation how many complaints are on that one operation. Correct. For, for because of because of the fact that the air noise report system doesn't provide any address information or latitude and longitude of where someone's filing a complaint or 
even who the complainant is. We, we don't have any way of knowing, you know, how many individual people complained about a specific flight. Now, we can look at, you know, the air noise, specifically the air noise report and air noise IO complaints because it has, um, because it has in it um, the aircraft registration information. Those we can say, okay, this aircraft registration had this many complaints associated with this operation. And actually, um, we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation because um, we, we did do an analysis of that. Of, you know, for the complaints where we know what aircraft it was, the complaint was filed against, we can say, you know, there were this many complaints about this flight, and there were this many operations by this aircraft. So we can say, you know, how many complaints were filed per that operation. Um, but for the com those, those other complaints, if you want to look at how many people complained about an operation, that's more difficult because most of the complaints don't have a specific aircraft registration associated with them if they were filed using an address. Um, and, and in that case, we really can't say for sure, except the air noise IO complaints, those we can because those have the address and a registration of an aircraft associated with it. Um, you know, we can look at you know, how many individuals filed complaints about that one aircraft in particular, but um, because of the other data sources that are address-based, for those, they don't have the aircraft information, so we can't. So we can see what the aircraft address is, but not, um, you know, the, the other information, so to speak. So I know it's a little bit complicated because we're trying to synthesize three different data sources, and they all have different ways in which they process the data, but um, you know, it really depends on the data source as to what we can analyze. But what, what we've done here and what, what I'm going to show on the next slide is we've looked at of those complaints where it does have an address, you know, how many households, um, you know, how many addresses filed complaints that were unique, basically. So, you know, one household could file, you know, 500 complaints, for example. But, you know, it was just one household filing those complaints. And that, um, you know, that is one thing we looked at here. And later on, we do look more at what kind of I think you're getting at is the number of complaints associated with a specific flight. Um, you know, so we've kind of broken that out separately because it's kind of a little different as to what data sources we have to look at to analyze that. So looking at the next slide, again, this is just looking at the address-based complaints. So these are the plane noise complaints and air noise report manual complaints. Um, you know, we took the number of households that, that filed complaints within, um, you know, total per um, each of the the based on those data sets. Um, and if you look over time, you know, there were 475 households unique that filed complaints in 2015. Again, just from those, the air noise report manual and plane noise complaint data set. That dropped down to 371 households in 2016 and rebounded up above 500 to 582 in 2017. And then, you know, dipped a little bit in 2018, but has recovered up to about 553 unique households in, in, in 2019. Um, and we have here also the number of complaints per household, but it's just important to caveat that a little bit because those, those numbers are based on um, all the complaint data sources. Um, you know, those numbers would be less if we just looked at the individual plane noise and um, air noise report manual complaints. Um, those numbers would go down per household a little bit. So, but this just gives you a general idea of, you know, per for the complaints where we know that it's associated with an address, how many unique addresses were, were filing complaints? Again, the air noise report map complaints don't complain, contain that information and that's a large number of complaints. So, you know, that, that's something to consider in terms of, you know, how the numbers, there probably are more households than what we're saying, showing here filing complaints, but we can't definitively say how many because the, the information we have is based on the location of an aircraft, not the location of an individual filing a complaint. Um, and then looking at in terms of how the complaints were filed, um, you know, in terms of which system con constituted where most of the complaints were filed. So overwhelmingly, um, in 2019, 
67% of the complaints are filed through air noise report in that system. Um, that, that has been the trend since air noise report became operational in 2016. Um, you know, people have gravitated toward using that complaint system um, and, and shifted away from using plain noise. Um, but still, plain noise did, con you know, have a, a large amount of complaints at 33%. Um, and then looking within those plain noise complaints, because that air noise I.O. system, which is new, submits its complaints to plain noise, um, you know, of the 33% of the plain noise complaints within that, you know, 70 Seven percent were sorry. Seven percent were received through air noise I/O. The remaining 93 percent of the complaints received in plain noise were through a combination of the, the, the hotline, um, email, mobile, or, or web form methods. And the most popular being the um, web form and mobile methods. I mean, there were some complaints that came in via the hotline and, and other methods. And we have an appendix at the end of this presentation that I'm not going to go through, but it breaks out. It kind of drills down into this data more. Um, but, you know, it does, the, the overwhelming majority of them, people like to use the web form and the, um, the specifically the mobile app. Um, uh, and again, excuse me, for, um, excuse me for interrupting, but um, we're nearly an hour in on the presentation and I believe this is 80, 80 slides. Is that correct? Um, it is, but we're not going to go through. There's a lot of slides at the end that uh, we, the, the presentation ends with the discussion slide. The remaining slides are primarily for um, just consistency with prior analysis and to drill down into the data more. Um, there are also the remaining slides here that, that I'll go through them quickly because a lot of them are images. Um, you know, one of the things we do with the complaints is we take and map them to the location of where the complaint was filed either where the airplane was at the time the complaint was filed or the address, depending on the system. Um, and it just shows the distribution of complaints, you know, on the East End and relative to East Hampton. Um, you know, I can, you know, we can we can go to discussion if you want, um, you know, or I can go through those slides quickly. I, I leave yeah, up to you. Please I, please continue. I just uh, I would ask you to try and summarize some of the information um, if you can. Yep. Um, so just going off of, of what I said previously on the last slide, um, you know, really this just shows how the complaints have been filed based on whether it's been plain noise or air noise report. The plain noise complaints include air noise I.O. But the real takeaway is complaints have shifted, you know, since 2015 toward overwhelmingly being filed through air noise report instead of um, plain noise. And looking at in terms of Complaints to operations, um, you know, looking at complaints, the number of complaints versus the number of operations. So, you know, how many, on average, how many operate, how many complaints were filed for a given operation of an, an aircraft type at East Hampton? Um, you know, helicopters had the most at four, on average, complaints per operation. Undefined had the second. Um, just one thing to note is it's a low number of complaints and operations that were associated with undefined aircraft. So that's the reason. That, that that's occurring. Seaplanes had the third most at around three, and land planes had the least. Um, so really, the, the takeaway here is that, um, you know, if you're looking at in terms of the number of operations and the, the average number of complaints associated with that operation within a given aircraft type, it's overwhelmingly bad in helicopters and seaplanes that are the ones that are most complained about. And excluding the undefined operations and multiple and, um, you know, that they've shifted more and more toward helicopters and seaplanes, which is consistent, you know, looking at the complaint and operation data. Um, the next series of slides, as I, I kind of just alluded to, these are complaint density plots. So it shows the density of complaints over a given area, um, you know, that were, that were filed and it's either based on, you know, that we took based on the complaint data that was received. So if it, you know, depending on if it was an air noise report complaint, depending on if it was mapped or manual, it can either be the location of the aircraft or the, or the address of the person filing the complaint. Likewise, with plain noise, um, you know, it'll be based on the address of the person filing the complaint. So this slide is showing here each dot represents a place where either an air, someone complained about the location of an aircraft or an address that 
that a person resided at when they filed a complaint. Um, and this is a complete data set, both plain noise and air noise report for the complete implementation period. Um, and this shows you, you know, that the, basically the, the more dots there are and the darker the color, and the, the combination of the two is, you know, the more complaints were filed in a certain location, so a higher density or concentration of complaints. Um, and you'll see this as we go into the other slides, especially looking at the helicopter complaints, but they do, you know, while yes, there are complaints that could be associated with aircraft transit, transiting the airspace, you can see that they're pretty well clustered around the, the location of the East Hampton Airport and aligned with the runways, and, and you'll see a little bit later also the, the helicopter noise abatement routes that were in effect in 2019. So again, this is looking at all the complaints. This is looking just at the complaints from air noise reports that are mapped, meaning these are based on the location of the aircraft at the time the complaint was filed. So this is not based on where someone lives, it's based on where the aircraft was when the complaint was filed. Um, again, you know, there could be some aircraft transiting, transiting, transiting the area in these complaints, but a lot of them do align with the runways and are in real close proximity to the East Hampton Airport. These are the manual complaints from air noise. In the same time frame, how many, total how many total operations were there in the same time frame? Um, there was roughly, it was around um, 19,000, I believe. So we're looking at 26,000 complaints for 19,000 operations. Well, total 46,000 complaints. But it was 26,000 just from air noise report, the mapped complaints. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then these are manual complaints from air noise reports. So these are address-based complaints um, from the air noise report data source. So you can see there are lots, but again, these are based on the location of an individual when a complaint was filed. And then these are all the complaints from plain noise. Um, again, these all these complaints are based on the location where an individual was located at the time when a complaint was filed. Um, I think the next couple slides are really helpful because we're here we're looking at a synthesis of, you know, we're just looking at complaints associated with helicopters, um, you know, which is one of the categories that, that was most complained about. Um, and, and again, the, this slide is showing both complaints that are based on an address and the location where a helicopter was at the time a complaint was filed. Um, but what you can see in this slide and then in the next slide is that you know, these complaints really do align um, relatively well with the helicopter noise abatement routes that were in effect in 2019, um, which, which are shown um, on the map. Um, again, there could be some aircraft that were transient that, you know, that got complained about. Um, but you can see pretty well, you know, like especially the November route and the Sierra routes, um, you know, the helicopter complaints where those complaints were filed aligns, either whether it was the location of the helicopter or an address, um, they align pretty well with those noise abatement routes. And it would make sense because that, you know, that is largely where the helicopters were flying. And then looking at seaplanes, um, you know, the, the thing to consider with the seaplane complaint is that, you know, again, this is air noise report and plane noise. Um, you know, they do align pretty well with, with, the, with the runways, um, specifically, specifically runway 1028. Um, you can see there's a cluster of them along the runway center line, which, which would make sense because they're either landing or departing from East Hampton. Um, but, you know, there are some complaints that are away from the airport that there is a chance that they could be transient aircraft or they could be, you know, an aircraft, the seaplane might have decided to land, you know, in the bay or, um, you know, have done a water landing and there may be a complaint associated with that as well. But there, you can see that they are pretty well clustered around the airport and around, along the runway center line. So the last piece of analysis and then, you know, we'll, we'll go to open it up for any further questions and um, discussion is that, you know, we did look at, and as I mentioned this before, um, to what Councilman Lee said was that, um, you know, there is, you know, we, there, we do have the ability with the complaints to look at the aircraft, specific aircraft types 
in some of the complaints that people complained about. Um, and then we can take those complaints and match them up to operations that occurred at East Hampton. So we know that a complaint was filed against this aircraft registration number or tail number, you know, November 12345. And that same tail number is in the vector system and operated at East Hampton that same day. So we know, you know, if, if a complaint has a registration number in it, we can go in and then look at, at the vector system and say, oh, November 12345, this complaint was filed on this day. Let's look at the East Hampton Airport. Oh, November 12345 flew out of the East Hampton Airport this day. So we know that those, those complaints are associated with operations at, at East Hampton. We can, we can make that statement because the complaint data has registration information for some of the complaints, not all. It's only the air noise report mapped complaints and the plane noise complaints that we receive from air noise IO that have that because it uses ADSB and load S information, which includes specific aircraft type and registration data. So what we've done in this last piece of the analysis is we've looked at for those complaints where we do have an aircraft registration or an aircraft type, um, you know, we look at, okay, did this type operate at East Hampton? Yes. How many complaints were filed against this aircraft and how many operations occurred at the East Hampton aircraft for that same aircraft or aircraft type? Um, cause there are, you know, there's individual tail numbers and registrations, which is a specific aircraft. And then there's aircraft types, which is a broader category of aircraft, you know, like a Cessna Caravan, which is commonly a seaplane. Um, you know, or an F-76, which is a, a, you know, a noisier type of helicopter. So looking, you know, we, we did this analysis and just at a very high level, there's more detail if you want to drill down into the slides at the end of, you know, following um, this next slide, which is the end of the presentation of what we were going to present today. Um, you know, the F-76, which was a helicopter, a noisy helicopter at that, um, meaning it was above the 91. Um, TV perceived, um, you know, sound level is that um, that had the most complaints. Looking at the the complaint data set, where we know what aircraft types were operating, it's 7,048 complaints, and they performed the second most number of operations of any aircraft model at East Hampton at 2,365. Um, the Cessna Caravan, which is a seaplane, and not well, I should caveat this, not all Cessna caravans can be seaplanes, but we did an analysis of the vector data based on the images in the data set to determine which Cessna caravans were and were not seaplanes. Um, but of the ones that, you know, were seaplanes, that was the aircraft that led to the second most complaint um, at 5,768, and they performed the second most number of operations at East Hampton at 2,500 approximately. And then the third most complaint about aircraft was the Bell 407, which was an other helicopter, and those per happened to perform the third most operations at East Hampton. Um, so, um, you know, the 2019 data really confirms looking at this, that, you know, complaints are a function of both the, the aircraft noisiness, but also the frequency of the operation, because here you have the three most complained about aircraft types, and they also happen to have the, the, the three most um, you know, highest amounts of operation. So I, with that, um, I'll open it up to general discussion. I'm, I'm sorry, I may have, you know, I know this was a lot of information to go through and I wanted to try to, um, you know, not, not go too far down in the weeds, but explain everything to the level that, that would make sense as to how we did the analysis and some of the caveats of that. And, um, you know, so any questions you may have, you know, Happy to, oh, to answer. Adam, let me just say that this was a very, very thorough presentation and, uh, you know, gives us a really good idea and a lot of insight as to what aircraft caused the greatest number of complaints and uh, operations overall, how we're trending as an airport. Um, you know, I, I think that seeing um, what, we, what we all kind of know is that most of the complaints uh, center around helicopters and seaplanes. Uh, but I think the other thing that's kind of concerning, at least to me, is the uh, overall increase of operations that continues to go up 23% of an increase over five year period, 8% just in the last year. Um, so I, I think we see this as uh, not an, only an ongoing problem, but a growing problem. And uh, for me, that's very concerning. 
Uh, council people have any questions or comments to make about the presentation? Yeah, well, one last question I have is, as we heard from some of the, um, the callers in, just to get the most rep representative data, is, is there any way to mine this data, the, the breakout, the general aviation users that are based out of H2O right now? Either from complaints or um, users? Yeah, that, so there is, there would be a way to do that. I would have to coordinate, um, you know, with, with Jim Brundage, the airport manager, to get the records as to who's based you know, which, which specifically for operations, we could also do that for complaints too, for some, for the complaints where we know. Are you asking but, for based aircraft data or are you trying to discern uh, actual operations at the airport versus those that might be over flights to some other location? Because well, no, I, I, I heard a caller asking, you know, for that correlation, you know, what flights are actually associated with H2O versus maybe it would be for, actually for for both of them. So okay. the ones correlated for H2O, I think are extremely important instead of the ones that might be going to a different location, but also just to find out what our, what our, our fleet, if you want to say that it's based out of H2O is more, more on my, my question is more specifically based out of H2O as our home base of operations. Understood. Yeah, that, that is something that, um, you know, I, again, I'd have to coordinate with, with Jim Brundage on that just because he, you know, he has the records for, you know, who's leasing and base, leasing hangar space and basing aircraft at East Hampton. But um, if we had that data, we could go in and, and drill down to see, um, you know, what, what, what the percentages of flights that are based out of East, you know, considered based being that they're, they keep their airplane at East Hampton versus, you know, just flights that are landing and departing, but they don't, you know, they don't stick around their charter or, or whatever. Um, and, and regarding correlating the complaints to operations at East Hampton, um, you know, there is, you know, we, we've kind of already done that for some of the flights. For the, the flights that we have registration information, um, you know, in the complaint data, which would be the Air Noise Report map complaints and the um, complaints now from plane noise, that are submitted from Air Noise IO, you know, that we already do matching to see if those registrations did in fact operate out of East Hampton based on the data in the vector system. Mm -hmm. um, where it gets complicated is at the complaints that are filed from plain noise that are based on, um, that are not coming from Air Noise IO or that are based on someone's address in the manual complaints from Air Noise Report. Those complaints don't have any aircraft registration data, and it's just a it's it's filed at a certain time, and you know we can do some correlation of what's in the vector system to what is being filed in plain noise based on the time at which the complaint was filed, um, and and I know the vector system does some correlation on its own to to with those complaints um, in terms of. Using a flight, using a flight track, and the, the location of the address and the time that the complaint was filed. Um, the only thing is, I, I would have to caveat that that there, you know, there is a chance that we may end up identifying that that some operator wouldn't. I don't know that it would be 100% accurate, just because there's some uncertainty as to, right. you know, that you're, when a complaint is filed and how long after an airplane flies over it's filed. Um, it, it, it's very dependent on a lot of those factors. So. Understood. But I guess the uh, the manual filing is also a much lower percentage of total complaints. Is that correct? Did I understand that from the data? Correct. It's, it's overwhelmingly the air noise report map right. complaint. So, so the, the chance of a, an aircraft not being specifically identified by a tail number um, and then being able to be correlated would be significantly lower and probably the overflights that aren't associated with H2O are, are likely to be a much lower number percentage of the overall complaints. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, I, I think so. And, that, and that's something we could do, you know, if, if the town wanted, that would be you know, a lot, it'll be a little bit easier to do than going through the, the manual or the address-based complaints, but we could look at the, the complaints from Air Noise Report and, and the ones from Air Noise IL that are in plain noise um, and try to get you, you know, get a percentage of what percentage of the total number of complaints were associated with flights that did in fact operate out of East Hampton or not based on the, the registration. That, that seems like a, a pretty uh, quick way to get at at least a better understanding of 
what the percentages are regarding uh, aircraft that might actually be overflying versus uh, associated with operations at H2O. Any other uh, oh, well, I guess it makes me think of, so like, what's the end game? So if the end game to do a comparison of operations and complaints for all those aircraft that are based at HTO versus those that are not based at HTO? No, I think, I think the question is not whether or not they're based or whether or not that oper the complaint is associated with an operation at the airport, whether it's based there or not, versus an aircraft that might be traveling to Nantucket or Block Island or whatever, it just happens to fly near our airspace and, and generates a complaint. And I, I think that's- if there's, a, if there's a simple way that we could get a, an idea um, about how many, you know, that we can establish how many are, are relate to HTO operations, I think that will give us a little comfort level that we're not using inaccurate figures that are distorted by, by flights just transiting through not using HTO. That, I think that would be the, that would be helpful. Yeah, we could get an idea of what the confirmed the percentage of confirmed operations associated with complaints versus unconfirmed. That would be an initial place to start. And then maybe, you know, if it's a significant number, to try and delve even further to see if you can parse out which may or may not be associated with H2O. So, okay. Would it, would it, but it would, so if we had 47,000 complaints in a year and 25% of them were flyovers. Is that really going to make a difference in decisions that we make? I'm, I'm just trying to understand um, what we would do with the information. I mean, whether we discount, I mean, 47,000 complaints is, you know, a, a huge number. Say it's half, you know, say it's 25,000 or for HTO operations. I mean, 25,000 complaints is still a tremendous number of complaints. I, I guess I'm just trying to understand what we would do with the information once we have. Well, I, I, I think, you know, having the best possible data to reflect what what complaints are directly associated with our airport is, is an important point to get to. I mean, I think that's pretty crazy. I, I think right. this, I mean, I guess the story's told to me on page 32 when I look at, um, you know, or when I look at the, the the routes overlaid you, you just showed it adam when you look at how the uh sierra and nevada and echo are overlaid over the complaints um that even if you just counted the complaints that were within um our routes tells the story well i think that that does tell the story but it doesn't necessarily tell the whole story and it, you know it, it, if it's not a terribly difficult thing to do to um, correlate the complaints directly to flights in and out of the airport. I mean, I, I think the, the visual uh, certainly looks like November inbound would be, uh, I, you can see the vast majority are. I just mm -hmm. think with those questions being raised by members of the public to be able to address it specifically, you know, I think it's important. And it may not just be members of the public. At some point, we may need that information. Well, I can follow up with uh, Adam offline on that and see if we can get some more information. I'm inclined to agree. It, I think it just sharpens our focus a little bit if we can get that additional information. Yeah, I, I think, I, I, I think uh, you know, Jeff's sharpening the point on it. Yeah, that's... That's what we want to do. We want to have the best possible data to back up whatever decision process that we go through. Any other questions for Adam yeah, at this point? Just or a comment? real quick question about um, what our our territory is, more or less. Aren't we five miles out from the airport in all directions? The circle? It's 4.8 nautical mile radius from the airport okay is our is our controlled airspace per se but this this obviously shows uh complaints beyond the 4.8 radius i believe <clears throat> um, so you, you have complaints all the way to orient point and 
you know, west to, uh, can't quite make that out. What town? Priest Park. Riverhead. So, to the west and beyond. So I guess my question is, are there any flights that come within our 4.8 nautical miles that are flyovers that our tower would even contact? If, well, if they, if they flew within the 4.8 nautical mile ring and did not land at East Hampton, um, you know, as long as they were within that and the, the, the altitude, which, which, you know, normally goes, you know, it's like 2,500 feet for class Delta when a control tower is operation or 2,000 feet. But, um, you know, they would have, if they fell within that cylinder of airspace to go through, you have to, they would have to talk to the aircraft, but the, you know, they, the aircraft wouldn't necessarily land at the airport. Now, if they, as long as they were outside of that cylinder of airspace, the aircraft would not have to talk to the control tower um, at all if they wanted to transit. But if they wanted to actually penetrate that that cylinder, that 4.8 mile radius up, you know, um, when the control tower is in operation, then yes, they would have to they would have to talk to the tower to get it, you but know, the, to get the tower. Airspace doesn't necessarily it doesn't generate a, a complaint just based on whether or not it's in the airspace. Okay. Yep. Any other questions for Adam? Adam, I, I want to thank you and uh, Mary Ellen Egan uh, for this fine work and presenting us with the best possible data. And I guess we'll ask that you may, um, further refine it as discussed. Um, but I think this is very helpful to us in a decision-making process and just for the general public to understand the impacts that air uh, travel has on our town and uh, the number of complaints generated. So we appreciate all your time and effort. And Jeff, I want to thank you for uh, working to get this presentation before the public and the board. I think it's really important uh, to, again, see the, the changes over the what is uh, now a five season period of time. And uh, I think it definitely puts into sharper focus the impacts of having this airport and uh, our concerns, the long running concerns about those operations and how we might better uh, make adjustments to uh, better serve our constituents and the general public. So again, I thank you. I'd like to move on now to our next agenda item, which is uh, Oak Grove Cemetery expansion. Some years ago, um, and I was on the board at the time, we purchased property adjoining the Oak Grove Cemetery in order to uh, have a future expansion of that cemetery. And uh, David Lease has been kind enough to put together a presentation uh, on the efforts that he's, uh, he's been undertaking to expand that, that cemetery. So David, I'll, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Peter. I'm just gonna do a screen share of a small little presentation that I, worked on here. Um, does that everyone have that up on their screen? Um, yes. Great. Okay. Uh, so the Oak Grove Cemetery is a cemetery at 131 uh, Wimmo Lane in Amagansett. Uh, it's an older cemetery that's been around since the early 1900s, and it's actually in the town control with town maintenance on it. Currently, the Oak Grove Cemetery um, is actually at full capacity with uh, plots that were purchased by many individuals in the town of uh, East Hampton. Um, full capacity being the plots have already all been purchased. Um, there are a lot of longtime families that live in there, a lot of war heroes also. It's a very lovely little spot on, on Windmill Lane, a little cherished area of, of Amagansett. Uh, this actually blue mapping is actually uh, outlines the location of the property of the current Oak Road Cemetery. Uh, if you ever driven by, the cemetery is marked by the white picket fences. 
excuse me for the little blurry photo, I probably should have slowed down. Um, <laughs> it's a cemetery with different types of headstones, different family members in there uh, and groups. Uh, there are multiple war heroes in, uh, in the cemetery. This is a war hero from World, World War II. Um, I actually have some information back from Hugh King. He quickly looked into it for me, maybe bring some more information later on. Earliest details he has on the cemetery is from 1913, uh, and that one of the first inhabitants of, of the cemetery or interned, the cemetery was uh, the deceased daughter of one of the Gosman family. Uh, and lo and behold, his sidebar is that his grandparents are also interned there too. Uh, this is the earliest recorded survey that I have, originally surveyed from 1914, which showed the original uh, cemetery box. This is copied from 1951. You can show the, how they had the lanes of the cemetery. Let's remember back then, a lot more people actually just walked into the cemetery and drove. Uh, to be noted is in the top left-hand corner where you, where you will see some very small plots in there. Uh, single grave plots as mentioned. Those are for potter's graves on there. Uh, currently uh, in talking with some of the uh, trustees of, that, of the cemetery committee, uh, they believe there might be one potter's graves there that's actually it was actively used, was overgrown, and that might be something we would have to look into potentially with some ground penetrating radar to see if there's any headstones or any use of that area. That's an area that we're not going to uh, disturb. The 2020 Board of Trustees for the Oak Grove Cemetery include uh, Carl Hamilton, Bruce Stometz, and Martin Mayhar. They are, uh, they are charged with uh, assisting with the rules and regulations of the cemetery, internment uh, through uh, the graveskeepers there, and any, any other questions. They also are the same cemetery uh, trustee board that actually uh, uh, assists with Atlantic Avenue Cemetery, which is another very old cemetery that's been uh, built to capacity. So where we are today, is in September 19, 2013, the town council authorized the purchase of the an additional 0.38 acres for, of land for the expansion of the Oak Grove Cemetery for $585,000. Uh, this was done through resolution and the property was directly adjacent south of the actual cemetery, directly onto the train tracks. Uh, as you see, sorry, I'll go back into the whereas clause on uh, there. It was for expansion of the, of the Oak Grove Cemetery or cemetery expansion. Uh, the two pictures here, the one on the left is where the, uh, the plot, uh, sorry, where the 0.3 acres that the town purchased in 2013 for the cemetery expansion. You see how it lines up directly with the, uh, the railroad tracks here, Windmill Lane, and also the current Oak, uh, Oak Grove Cemetery. And to the right is a picture of what the current property looks like right now with uh, the standing trees and how it's been maintained. We had a com combination of the two surveys put together just for everyone's uh, view. And so that we can go through the process of potential expansion of the cemetery. You can see that the current cemetery has this uh, loop of, uh, so individuals can drive and you can see how the new property is sited to the south against railroad tracks. In cons consultation with uh, uh, the Oak Road Board of uh, Trustees over the last year-ish, um, multiple meetings on site, with Tom Crouch Esquire from our town attorney's office who reviewed uh, New York State Cemetery law and also rules and regulations of some of our other cemeteries, specifically the Fort Hill Cemetery. We also discussed this with Ed Yardley from the Yardley Pino Funeral Homes about appropriate plot sizes. Uh, Scott Wilson of the land management and also with Len Bernard of the finance department. Um, we have some considerations for design use and rules and regulations uh, for this potential cemetery expansion. First of all, the design. It's very important to maximize this, uh, uh, the space available for new plots. In doing so, that allows to recoup any of the initial fees that we put uh, that we spent upfront or also our carrying costs and our debt service right now. Um, we wanted to make sure that we would plan for an attractive layout uh, that is in keeping with the character, not just of the, of the neighborhood, but also the current cemetery right now. Uh, we, we don't want to squish everything in there. These, these, we want to be very respectful of uh, uh, the people that would be 
letting in the rest of pe uh, in, in peace there. We want to make sure that any design was accessible for equipment that would be needed to intern individuals. Um, the, the, the soil there is actually, we can, we can hand dig it, but it's also going to be probably more wise to actually use a backhoe to go in. So we want to make sure there's ample, uh, ample size or width in between these plots um, for any type of equipment. equipment. Um, also in the discussing, discussion with Mr. Yardley, uh, the decision was to make sure that we have ample sized plots and design for the layout potential headstones in the soil conditions then too. Um, when we start talking about the policy of the potential cemetery expansion, uh, we were looking at the implementation of rules and regulations. And this is templated on Fort Hill Cemetery's policy. Uh, policies, I'll, I'll, and I'll send this over to the board. Tom, uh, Tom Crouch assisted us with this. Uh, primarily at Fort Hill Cemetery, it's a resident only cemetery. You can buy their plots. Uh, they can also sell back their plots only to the town uh, if they decided not, not to use them. Um, eventually, we would need to set the cost for the plots to recapture the initial funding and debt service as much as possible. Uh, and also, we would like to, uh, I would like to ask to see the board would be interested in putting a debt. Uh, set aside a dedicated reserve account with a percentage of each plot cost for the use of future cemetery maintenance within the township. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a little skewed in the size, uh, but using uh, our IT, we decided uh, uh, with those individuals that this would be one of the most attractive uh, plots and attractive site plans that we can design that would maximize the, the space. You can see in the right, uh, we would have uh, four foot by two 22 foot rectangles. That is giving a plot size of four by 11 foot plots. That is actually a foot larger than what is done by most standards. But this is based specifically on uh, recommendations from Mr. Yardley to allow for a future headstone and also for an overcut when you dig. Uh, the total plots then would have two rows there with a 10 foot buffer in between. And that would allow for any machinery to to go in between the plots as they would need to uh, intern the individual. In the southwest corner, which is the bottom left side here, you'll see again, another uh, section there. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were not used going anywhere close to those potter's graves in that area. Now in the top section above the 10 foot uh, buffer, we would actually be crossing over the property lines a little bit uh, now of, of, of what the current property line is but going to the other cemetery to allow for this expansion. On there, you would see that we would uh, incorporate a 12 foot, you know, uh, right away driveway for individuals to drive in on the Southern property line, which is along the cemetery, sorry, along the train tracks. And then we would also want to uh, incorporate more of the white fencing, traditional cemetery fencing along those new property lines, just to give boundary markers there also. Um, this is what I have to, I'm asking for for consideration of this project right now is, uh, yes, we purchased the property, we're paying the debt service on it, but there's some uh, also needed upfront costs that we would have to go out for right now. Uh, one of them would be for site work, uh, removal of the trees to prepare to prepare the site and then also uh, do, uh, uh, redo, the, redo the road. Uh, more specifically, uh, I think it's very important right now in discussion with uh, the Board of Trustees that were there is it did do survey work that would then set out the individual plots with pins or markers. This is uh, very important right now, we've discussed, because as uh, we all get older, uh, and get to a point where we might actually have to use the cemetery, uh, and the next Board of Trustees are there, we want to make sure that everything's set, uh, set in stone, if you want to say, with the plots, so they know exactly where the boundary markers are. Uh, it's something that's being used in some newer cemeteries now. We thought it would be good to try to uh, incorporate that into this design as we move forward. Also, the installation of boundary fencing. Uh, we would need to do a policy determination. Again, are these plots to be sold to only residents of East Hampton, as is what's being done out in, at Fort Hill Cemetery? Um, I have discussed this with uh, uh, Len Bernard, and we would, the recommendation there is actually. Uh, put an upfront cost out of uh, uh, out of surplus right now, and that that money will be then recaptured by the sale of the plots as we determine what a plot price would cost. 
uh, and that would then uh, be able to uh, recapture the money, pay for this initial upfront expense, and then again, eventually pay back some of the debt, the debt service, which is coming out of A fund, uh, and then also um, the, the cost for purchase, and then also set aside a percentage, potentially if the board would like, uh, for future cemetery maintenance within the town of East Hampton. So those are some of the, of, um, the, the consider, considerations and thoughts about this project. Um, I welcome any questions uh, on the project as we potentially move forward. Uh, I don't need all the answers now. I just want to pretty much broach it with you. Uh, but if you're, uh, if the board is supportive of this, I would like to try to move forward to potentially uh, requesting bids to do uh, the two major things, which would be the site work and then also the survey and the plot uh, mapping using uh, a professional surveyor. So, David, can, I, can I ask you something on the existing cemetery? Yes. What what are the size of these um, uh, parcels uh, in the in the older plan? They 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 look different than your new plan. Yeah, there uh, there are various sizes, Jeff, on there. Uh, let me just pull that into the survey for you. Um, they necessarily didn't sell plots, individual plots. They sell sold areas. So hence a family of. of uh, um, King family, you can see the loafers are in there. Uh, I've seen a, a Bistrian. They would actually uh, be sold a plot. Now, this wasn't a town. Uh, this was a private cemetery at one point. Uh, but what happened is that they would buy a large area to in turn potentially five or six individuals if they wanted to, whatever would fit in that area. So there was no dedicated plot sizes. The only ones you'll see in that top left-hand corner of that initial survey would be single grave plots and that was initially for the potter's graves i just i just think that the plan that i that i see for the southern property looks like a high density subdivision plan it's just you know cheek by jowl and I, you know i know uh the customs of burial differ uh, with different um uh, faiths actually um but it just doesn't look as inviting or gracious as the older plan. And I, I think I would prefer to see something like the older plan. Um, Cause I think, I understand your desire to um, amortize the price of the, of the purchase, but I think uh, more important, frankly, is the aesthetic result of the plan. And um, it kind of looks like you're, Takeoff is of the Potter's Field, you know, burial no, plot. That, that, that's an unfair takeoff, Jeff. It's not of the Potter's Field. The takeoff is very similar to Fort Hill Cemetery, which you know, you know, you know that well, being the liaison, and then also yeah. with Temple of Das, which is their cemetery, which the last cemetery expansion in the town of East Hampton, which is on 114, uh, which I actually sat on the Zoning Board of Appeals for, which they haven't gone through the expansion, but it was for the same layout. Again, this is a layout that was determined that would actually be able to, uh, th with, with consultation with Garley Pino, who are the professionals in, in this way, uh, to have a proper design for functionality of a cemetery, and then also uh, for uh, an appropriate appropriate design. Uh, so that, that's where we came come to this design discussion with with the trustees. I just I just think I I you know frankly. You know, I just got this this morning, but uh, my inclination would be to follow the pattern in the in the older part of the cemetery. I think it's more gracious and a little more uh, uh, country uh, flavor. I, I I think I'd hate to see a sharp contrast between the new section and the old section. And looking at the old section, I, I like it better. Um, well, thank you. Jeff, if, if you look at the old section, and I can bring back some of the pictures here in the discussion, I'll screen share again. Um, you'll see the cemetery is in rows. So it, within each one of those initial surveys, if you can see this on here, is that there's rows of, uh, of, of headstones. There's no footstones, of course. So within these rows here, where you'll see one family, let's see if you go to the windmills, uh, uh, to this one here, where you'll see a, uh, the Petty family, okay? 
or the Bennett family above, and you'll see a, a grave marker on there. What it does look like when you go into this inside, Jeff, is you'll see then four or five rows specifically, uh, you know, design, just like this, Jeff. So they were sold to the families, but within each one, they had to stay within a design row to maximize space. I, I think the point the point is that the uh, the the layout in the survey doesn't necessarily reflect the spacing of the graves in actuality that they are as you put it cheek and jowl um, but I think I'll just say that you know having been on the board at the time of this acquisition uh, and having the public hearing we presented this to the general public for acquisition with the idea of how it would be developed. And this is actually less dense than what uh, was envisioned originally when the acquisition took place. Um, I don't, you know, as much as I, I think the aesthetic is important, especially from the street, uh, I don't think we want this to necessarily be an inviting location in terms of uh, uh, those who might reside there. Um, you know, I think having uh, the surrounding, trying to preserve as much of the existing trees as possible while still providing the necessary expansion of plots um, is desirable. Um, but, you know, we, we presented this that uh, the costs of, uh, uh, to, the, to the purchaser of the plot would offset the debt service uh, in, in this acquisition. So I think there's, uh, the general public had um, the understanding that we would do our best to uh, not only cover the cost of the debt service, but to also cover some of the ongoing maintenance costs by by taking on this acquisition. So um, that is correct. Initially, I, in, in, the, in the resolution, there was upwards of 360 plots. You know, or 240 to 360 plots was the number. And this is going to be under 200. So the density is There's a is, significant is, reduction as right. it is. And so uh, you can have as to what was presented and approved by the public and by the board at the time. So, you know, I, I, I feel that, uh, you know, this proposal is already a significant reduction. And I would be concerned about reducing it any further. Well, I just want to, my, my vote would be to, to, I think one of the, reasons that the other cemetery looks the way it does is because you've had people like families that have larger plots and then yes they put you know various headstones within their family plot i think it produces a nicer aesthetic and a nicer look and i'm all in favor of that i think some things are more important than you know uh, money more important than amortizing you know our purchase price and i think uh, a cemetery is one of those things yeah i just think our ability Go ahead, Kathy. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to look at it from another perspective. You know, I have not been um, in the market of shopping for uh, cemetery plots. Maybe, David, if, if you could share with us, did Mr. Yardley talk about, you know, uh, what the demand is in this community to be buried here and what the availability is? Well, that's a, so, Mr. Yardley, I did not talk to Mr. Yardley about that question, but that's a very good point, Kathy. Uh, currently, the town of East Hampton actually has a list in the clerk's office for individuals that are looking for cemeteries right now, and that list is close to 40 people. Um, and I, I'll be honest, mortality to me, I, I've actually looked where I would want to be in the town of East Hampton. Um, I haven't added to that list, but there are a number of people that are interested, and in discussion in this, uh, 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 frankly, I, I, you know, I brought this up to ACAC last night, the Amagans at CAC last night, uh, supportive of it. Uh, I think they now know that the property is going to be expanded. A lot of people that would like to be uh, buried in turn forever, not just in their hometown, but in their home hamlet. This is an option for them because there's no other option in Amagansett. The only other cemeteries I know that have room to expand in the town of East Hampton right now in expansion uh, would either be, as, as I said, Tepla Das, which is doing theirs. Uh, there is the Catholic Cemetery on Cedar Street. And, uh, only the, the, lar the other largest one I know would be the Lily Hill Cemetery. Yeah, the, where there's room, up. there's a lot of room up there. Correct. And then, David, if we were, to, and, and I appreciate you taking but this project. Both of those are also privately held, too, and I don't know what any of their plans are. 
I appreciate you taking us on. Obviously, the town purchased this property quite some years ago, and that you know, I know you've recently appointed the board of trustees for the for the cemetery. And um, if we were to give you the go ahead, what, what would be the time frame? Do you think that you know we would be ready to um, you know start you know selling these um, these plots? Uh, I don't think the time frame. Oh, that the curveball is COVID right now, yeah. obviously. Uh, I think the time frame could be, you know, early to 2021. I think that's mm -hmm. a, a good time frame, not to rush anything, to get it correct, um, and to make sure everything's done appropriately. I have to say that I'm supportive of the project, and I appreciate you bringing it to us. I also think that thinking ahead and putting together, having a future maintenance fund makes a great deal of sense so that, you know, it, it is self-supportive. And I can imagine when word gets out that this is a project that's you know being contemplated that there, you'll hear that a lot of folks in our community has have great interest in um, you know purchasing uh, which, for their so, for their families. Which brings up a question that David has asked about uh, making it available, whether or not to make it available to residents only. I would support making it available only to residents of the town. Um, I think that's appropriate given the limited space and the fact that uh, the town undertook significant uh, financial cost in order to expand the cemetery, as well as a significant cost in uh, basically taking over what was a private cemetery. As uh, the other board members know that once a cemetery goes bankrupt or ceases to exist uh, on its own, that it becomes the responsibility of the town in which it uh, resides to take over that cemetery and to maintain it. And that's true with our very old colonial cemeteries and family burying grounds uh, throughout the town. David, uh, I wanna commend you again for your work on the restoration of those, the Parsons, which is uh, currently underway out on Old Stone Highway uh, and uh, on Northwest Road. Uh, the Van Scoy Cemetery. Uh, we have a number of other cemeteries that date back to colonial days, which uh, which are in need of attention too. And I really appreciate you taking that on to restore those. Uh, but you know, as uh, we recently ended up acquiring the Green River Cemetery, uh, which could no longer maintain uh, those grave sites. So I think you know the town has a fiduciary responsibility. Um, in order to, to maintain these cemeteries. And uh, this was an opportunity that the town board in 2013 saw to expand an existing cemetery to help cover some of the costs, uh, as well as provide uh, additional burying ground for its residents. So I, I would support having it resident only. And uh, David, I wanna thank you for all your work on that. Oh, yeah, I just want to chime in, uh, David. Thanks. Um, I was on the board when we purchased the property, so I'm glad to see that uh, it's moving forward. And I, I think just to maybe address some of Jeff's concerns, as you said, David, earlier, you know, people bought a whole area to, you know, add family members. And my guess would be that people would do that here as well. They might buy four or five plots. Um, in a row or in a section. And therefore, what you are looking at in the earlier part of the cemetery, you'll see as people combine those small parcels together to make one big block for the, you know, for their family. So I, I think I'm not as concerned about that. Um, I still think it will have a very rural aspect to it. And um, I like the fencing that's there, and I think continuing that fencing gives it that rural feeling as well. And, you know, hope we can, um, you know, look at the trees as we move forward to see which ones we can keep, because I think that also helps um, with this. And, I, you know, it might be helpful for Jeff to, to know how many are in each block the, of the original, that, that how many sites or how many people you can put into each of those blocks, what it was geared towards. And that might, you know, help allay some of those fears. 
So I, I find the plan acceptable. And in fact, it might even have a few more plots put in there. There's sort of a couple of sections um, where the curve of the road is that, you know, maybe it might be able to be laid out a little differently. It doesn't appear as though there's a tree there. The, the road that is the right of way kind of along the, um, the railroad tracks. Yep. Yeah, so, I, think, I think this is going to be a, a little bit of a plus or minus as far as yeah. the numbers when we yeah, get okay. in there. Um, it's, Jeff, your concerns are heard loud and clearly. It's very difficult to uh, plot something like this on a, a GIS. Right. Um, and, no, and take, take it down right onto the ground, sort of ground. So it, you know, if there was a better way to do it. I think the best way we can do it is. No, I, I can tell you the right visual. There. The visual is great because it does help, and I know it's not you know perfect, but um, anyway, I yeah. you know I, I I think in the long run we'll end up with a very rural look and a um and it will you know have the feeling of the rest of the cemetery and just add to it. So. Um, Thank if you. you don't mind, what I do with the board right now is um, I will get the draft of the rules and regulations that we template on a Fort Hill Cemetery over to you know the board for just review. Again, we have time moving forward. I just wanted to see if the board wanted to move forward on this right now, uh, and that if if you're okay with that, that I can start going out looking for the bids for um, for the, the survey and the potential site work that might be needed, and I can keep everyone. Uh, in, the, in the loop and up to date on this, again, as it's going to take time time to do. Uh, people are dying to get in. So, <laughs> get on the phone. I knew someone was going to say that. <laughs> I get it. I get it. So, um, thank you very much for listening and consideration, everyone. Thank you, David. Uh, from from cemeteries, we'll move on to bats. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like gone. Halloween now. <laughs> And, and by the way, the scariest thing about Halloween this year will be if people are not wearing masks. Yeah. Um, so we had um, been contacted by the New York State DEC, uh, Casey Pendergast, um, quite a while back about uh, doing some long-eared bat research. The long-eared bat is uh, native to New York, but it's been extirpated from most of the state and no longer exists anywhere in New York State except for on Eastern Long Island. Uh, there was a bat hibernicula located in Montauk of all places in culverts there. Um, and due to additional research and study, um, which we um, permitted, I believe last year, the um, DEC has, has uh, expanded their information and knowledge about the bats in our area. We had um, some of the research took place right here at our East Hampton ball fields where they set up uh, transducers to record and monitor for bat species, uh, collecting acoustical data, as you know, they um, echo locate to find their prey and uh, fly through obstacles, um, so their their echolocations were recorded. Uh, the East Hampton Panago ball fields and the East Hampton Recreation Department area were where they put up some of those um, audio uh, recorders, and they discovered there were long-eared bats here, as well as big brown bats, silver-haired bat, and eastern red bats. So, um, in furtherance of of their research because they want to identify additional hibernaculas, uh, which are places where they hibernate within the town. Uh, they would like to do some additional uh, acoustical study as well as set up uh, some net traps. They're mist nets, which are extremely fine uh, nets, so fine that the bats don't actually see them, quote, see them with their echolocation. Uh, and they'll be monitoring those nets every 10 minutes while they're uh, put out and we would like to put these out on some uh, town properties and do so obviously after dark when the bats are active with the goal of um, measuring weighing and identifying the species of bat and particularly um, attaching uh, uh, transmitters on the long-eared bats so that they can again identify you know, identify places where they hibernate uh, within the town 
uh, with the idea of further studying and protecting those hibernation sites. Again, they're uh, a uh, state and federally threatened species. Uh, bat populations of several species of bat have been decimated by uh, fungal growth, uh, which may be related to uh, climate change. Um, and bats are an integral part of our ecosystem as they consume massive quantities of, uh, of uh, insects, particularly mosquitoes and, and other uh, insects that are harmful to crops within the town. So I hope the, the town board members will support the further study of the long-eared bat and the other associated uh, research. Are there Very supportive of it, yes. Questions about that? Fine with me. Yeah. And we will send a letter of uh, support and uh, whatever other permissions are required, uh, landowner permissions to the DEC so they can continue that research. Appreciate that. And that brings us up to liaison reports. Okay. Kathy, you have a liaison report for I us. I do. So uh, Human Services Department is standing by. If anyone needs assistance or essential services, they should reach out to the folks at Human Services Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Their phone number is 631-329-6939. Um, I mentioned last week that we had um, crossed the 20,000 meals delivered to seniors. So just wanted to keep you updated. As of yesterday, Monday, July 13th, we've delivered 21,234 meals since March 10th, which, you know, is a, it's just, just a staggering number. Uh, and we continue to make weekly wellness calls to our seniors to make sure we use it as like a wellness check and make sure everybody uh, is doing okay and if there's any services uh, that they need or anything they want to share with our uh, human services staff. Um, switching gears to special events, um, we've been getting, I had mentioned last week, a number of inquiries from folks about special, event, uh, uh, special events as we move into phase four. So to, um, to be proactive, we updated the uh, notices on the town website on our special event page. So we basically populated it with the frequently requested information, what we've been getting the most phone calls about. So, uh, you know, we've said all along, there was an executive order by Governor Cuomo about 50% capacity on the beaches. I guess it was at the end of June, beginning of July, he issued, the, the state issued interim guidance for beach activities during COVID-19 public health emergency. And uh, in that guidance, it states, you know, not only are beaches limited to 50% 50, 50 capacity, but it bans, in quotes, large gatherings, picnics, and beach parties. Uh, so, and that, you know, is in effect during phase four. So the town is not in a position to issue special event permits for any event on the beach, including catered events, regardless of their size. Uh, we're also getting inquiries from uh, residents wanting to know if they could have a gathering at their home. Uh, so again, uh, you know, residential gatherings are limited to a maximum of 50 people. Uh, if they can meet four conditions, they do not require a special event permit for uh, under 50 people. And those conditions are, again, less than 50 people, outdoor music turned off at 9 p.m., cars, you know, parked on the residential property and no tent would be erected. If, uh, if they want to have music louder, if they have to park on the street or they intend to uh, put a tent up, then they do need to come to the town for a special event permit. Uh, and then we've also been getting quite a few inquiries about wedding receptions. So, um, Again, under phase four, wedding receptions are limited to 50 people, and that includes the staff, but they're also subject to relevant SLA, State Liquor Authority guidance, and New York State Department of Health uh, guidance. So on the uh, special event page, we have a link so that uh, folks that are looking to have a wedding out here, either this summer or this fall, should you know, do their research before they reach out to the town. 
And then I just wanted to touch base, you know, uh, last month we uh, hired a communications firm, Berlin Rosen, to help us communicate to the community public health and safety guidelines. And as we open our economy, we wanted to reassure our, our residents and visitors and businesses, you know, how we can do so, you know, safely. So we've been uh, working with them on an umbrella campaign for this, um, for this effort. Um, and we're talking about, you know, individual safety, wearing a mask, social distancing. We're posting New York State forward COVID guidance and protocols. We've talked beach safety. I really appreciate the cooperation with uh, Councilman Lease. He's been giving us a lot of information as, you know, our beaches are opening, as we're starting to uh, launch our, um, you know, clinics and junior lifeguards and lifeguards and and how parks and whatnot are, are operating and opening. Uh, we're talking about safe shopping and dining, uh, town news, community events, human interest stories, um, and the protection and preservation of our natural environment. So uh, we're, you know, we have a weekly call with Berlin Rosen, and we will be coming forward with that campaign um, quite shortly. So I just wanted to, to mention that. And then I was just lastly wanted to understand, I know um, we talked, I guess for the last few weeks about putting the transcripts for our public hearings on the website. I went on, on today and I, I couldn't find it. Correct me if I'm wrong, if it's posted because I had been on a call last week um, with bond council on a, on a different matter and I know that there's sensitivity with the timing for a public hearing we had in May about the uh, as because we're going out, I guess for. Uh, yeah, they're, they're on. They're on August. the. Um, some of them have been posted. I uh, couldn't find them, David. What would I like? Because I googled transcripts. I googled public hearing. I looked for links and yeah. I couldn't find if you, it. If you go onto the, the website page. Let me just go back here. Uh, Agendas Center. You, you go to the agenda page on the town website. You then go to the document center on the town website. Once you're in the document center, then you bring it down to uh, transcripts. And then the transcripts there will, will be there for either uh, AR, uh, for the planning board, ARB, town board, ZBA. You then click on the town, the town board ones and they'll open up to some of them that have been posted. Uh, you'll see that they're all on there either for the we had. I apologize. If you could I just start discuss putting a having quickly, a link on the home page. Quick link to the home page, Jeff, and I thought you were going to follow up with IT on that. If you go to the home page yeah. and put your cursor over government, right there on the front, right under agenda and minutes, it says transcripts. And there's a link right there. It takes you to the transcripts for all the boards. Okay, but you have to go to government. It's not a separate... Button. It's funny, when I Googled transcripts, it didn't come up. We were, uh, in answer to your question, Peter, yes, I did follow up on this. Uh, John has been helpful, Thomas Crouch has been helpful, and Heath has been helpful. And uh, the, the uh, location that David's describing is the one that uh, Heath came up with um, as the, the simplest to do. Um, where you can go to a, pa a page that's just for transcripts, and we've made significant progress on getting the ZBA transcripts up. Um, it took, it's, you know, it, there was a little backing and forthing uh, because we first had to uh, change the system we were using to get the transcript and go with uh, a human uh, transcriber. At first, we were using artificial intelligence. Um, and then we had to um, communicate amongst each other to have the start and stop times uh, go from LTV to, uh, uh, to uh, I guess, Thomas Crouch, who was actually communicating with Scribby to get them done. And uh, even after they're done, they have to be reviewed. And al along the way, as we were arranging that, um, we, we we were talking to Heath about where to land them on the um, on the web page. We were looking for the simplest place uh, to land them. He had talked initially about putting them somewhere else, but we concluded after some time that having a separate transcript page is the easiest way to go. Could, so could we're, we? Do we have an idea? Or have any of the town board uh, hearings actually 
Have those transcripts been produced? Five of them. Five of them are up. The other boards, there's nothing in, in A or B planning and zoning hasn't been posted. But is we it have possible? The posting dates. But now the posting dates on those transcripts as well. No, it, we have to keep track of posting because dates. we need to keep track of how right. many days it's been since they were posted because those hearings are set to close two weeks after the publication of transcripts. Correct. So who's, who's tracking them? I can I can uh, check in with Heath on that. Um, you know, I'm aware. I know Thomas is aware. I know John is aware of the two weeks. I just want to make sure it doesn't fall through the cracks and when that we're closing right. these. Well, I mean, particularly because there's time one time. that's time sensitive if we and, want to bond. Is it possible, though, maybe if we could put a story in um, on news and announcements that you, we could have a link there? Because when I Google transcripts, it doesn't come up. And yeah, there's a way to actually take that the page and use that page as the link. Yeah. And that's the simplest way to get there instead of trying to scroll through everything. Yeah. So we'll make sure that, that goes up. It was my suggestion initially was that we have one page that is a link that you hit and you're in. I'll yeah. talk. Where, wherever it's posted is the page and then you just have to copy the link and make that link available. So so maybe it's just a quick. Yeah, let, we'll figure out how to shortcut that. News and announcements would take you there. Okay. No, okay, that's what I've got. I don't know if there's a way to just put it right on the main page where you can just click, but this is the way he said was the easiest way to do it. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. It, it uh, might also, it might also help if it had, uh, you know, uh, you know, when you click on just script on transcripts, maybe it should have a a lead in that says, you know, during COVID and while you know board meetings are, um, you know, d done by teleconference. The town board is posting for you know their public hearings as well as you know the other appointed boards. So at least you know who, if you land on to, there I think that's what, a you're, good idea. what you're looking at. That's a good idea, Kathy. And mention you... the five, you mention the two week posting time and, and things like that. Because otherwise you don't know what you're looking at. So who who wants to follow up with that? I'll follow up with Keith. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. That's great. Thank you. He's been very cooperative and does a good job. Yeah, and maybe you could just draft a, a you know a paragraph, Jeff, that could be by that landing page would be helpful. No, that's all I've got, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, David. You're muted, David. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, Thank you very much. The Amigans at CAC met last night uh, via Zoom. It was a nice group. Nice to see everyone's face again. We had a wonderful presentation by Chief Sarlo there with a question and answer portion about the town's response uh, responses to COVID-19, social distancing, businesses reading and opening. Uh, he was very forthcoming uh, with all his information uh, and all the members of the committee who are very appreciative of the efforts that our town police department and emergency medical services have done and specifically that uh, Chief Sarlo had done. So I thank him for taking time out of his busy schedule to uh, come address the members of Akabon, uh, sorry, of Amagans at CAC. Um, on the agenda was the discussion about the post offices, uh, specifically the post offices in East Hampton, uh, sorry, in Amagansett. As we know, the Amagansa Post Office is a small post office, and a lot of people have been queuing up. Uh, as we saw in the paper recently, they're, they are uh, overwhelmed uh, and understaffed, I think is the easiest way to put it. Uh, through Steve Ballone's office and Lee Zeldin's office, I've also been in contact uh, with the Long Island uh, District um, head, Frank Calabresi. He's kind enough to send uh, Mr., uh, Steve Ballone's chief of staff, Amy Keyes, a letter. Uh, stating the same, that they're following all their protocols. That led into more of a discussion then for uh, what would it take to actually get Ambigansett, which does not have curbside delivery, to have curbside delivery. So there is a sub, uh, uh, there is a sub um, committee that is working through that. I know they've probably worked on it since Sylvia was there also. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a couple of the members were discussing that, and they're going to reach out again to Mr. Calabresi and try to bring back more information on that. Uh, I see that not just there, I see it in Montauk also. I know Montauk is overwhelmed with a lot of boxes and also in East Hampton where I waited over an hour. I think with COVID-19 right now, everyone's gonna be very patient with each other. 
uh, practice patients and, eat, and uh, practice uh, good stewardship of health. Um, we also discussed uh, the timelines for the parking lot construction, uh, which is ongoing the back parking lot. Uh, it's on schedule now to be paved in about three or four, three or four weeks right now. That's the construction uh, 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 timeframe that we have. Um, they're moving along with uh, the installation of the electrical work this week. Did I just freeze? No. Like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then that discussion went into the recommendations for time restrictions and the Amagansa parking field. Now, as you know, we're going to have a new parking field uh, in, the, in the northeast corner, and then also uh, the original parking field is going to be there too. Chairman, I hope we'll get um, a, a formal letter of recommendation to the town board shortly. Has been requested, but overall, uh, they are requesting that the 30 minutes and all the southern spots still be in that location. Uh, those are the ones that we did by town board resolution recently. So the whole southern row along the library would be 30 minutes uh, uh, parking spots. Uh, they also wanted to have the main lot all come two hours. That is the current lot. Uh, that would be between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Between May 15th and September 15th, with the caveat and the trigger being that there's no overnight parking on the first Monday of the month, which would allow for any abandoned vehicles to be removed. 72 hour parking in the new, uh, in the new lot, that would be for residents only. Um, and the two hour parking in the current lot would also include the EV spots, which is electrical electric vehicle spots, which there are six of them. Uh, thank you, Sylvia, for getting those moving forward. And then also for the handicapped spots then too. Uh, they also are supportive of allowing for one placard for, uh, for residencies and, uh, that have apartments above, uh, apartments above properties that are on the parking lot that do not have off-site parking also then too. So that will be discussed. We get the letter. Maybe we can discuss a little bit more at length next week and I can put it on to a survey so we can see how it works out. The reason I bring this up now, as we get to completion of the parking lot, there is a portion of the bid, which is gonna be for the striping of the parking. And I think it'd be appropriate to make this decision before uh, before that striping happens, so we don't have to spend taxpayer dollars to redo. Um, and again, the CAC also discussed, uh, and we're supportive of having uh, deer crossing signs on uh, uh, set up on a portion of Bluff Road specifically on the western portion uh, where there's a lot of deers that are deer that are crossing into the preserve area uh, and that there recently was an accident there. Um, as far as buildings and grounds, I want to let everyone know that the bathroom hours at um, four of the ocean beaches, including Indian Wells, Atlantic Avenue, South Edison, and, and Dish Plains are now open until nine o'clock at night. That means that they're going past lifeguarded hours. And they are still going through all uh, the cleaning protocols that have been set by the CDC. Uh, hopefully, this will assist with some individuals that might be on the beach a little bit later. We know we've heard some um, some, some requests for that recently too. Uh, the beach advisory committee that was formed in, in response to COVID nineteen also uh, had emails this week. Um, this current weekend, there were no capacity issues at our beaches. There was a capacity issue with parking at Atlantic Avenue, uh, not, not as long as they were from July 4th weekend. Uh, the beaches were narrow this weekend, as we know, because of the high surf from the tropical uh, storm that was passing a little bit to the west of us. We were on the northeast side, which always pushes a little bit more storm surge into our area. Uh, but the beach users uh, spread themselves out very well and allowed themselves to social distance from each other on the beach. Uh, please be advised of rip currents. Uh, I, I heard the uh, lifeguards were very busy this weekend and did a very good job of protecting our shorelines. And I think that's one of the reasons why the town board was so supportive of making sure that our beaches are guarded by not just our ocean, re our, our town lifeguards, but by our ocean rescue squads. Then too. Yeah, my son was actually at Beach Lane on the weekend and rescued two swimmers who got themselves into a rip and didn't know quite what to do, even though they were good swimmers. Didn't had the experience and he managed to get out to them and talk yeah. them through how to get out of the rip. So it was, uh, 
anytime we get a tropical storm or major storm offshore creates much higher surf and it's something everybody should keep in mind that uh, you really should only be swimming in guarded areas. Uh, I agree with you there, Peter. I think one of the, uh, one of the things that we'll keep pushing out onto the website is um, how you can link yourself up to our Town Lifeguard's web pages for surf conditions, which will show the flags. I know Kathy was working on that recently also, where they go from green flag, the yellow flag, the red flag, the no flag. We were at red flag this weekend. And then also how uh, to assist, you know, if you get caught in a rip current thing too. And maybe keep pushing that forward onto our social media platforms. Um, wearing of a mask in the parking lots is still being enforced. And we ask all for compliance of that. Uh, the town lifeguards and our beach ambassadors are still at our road ends. But just because those are our road ends at our ocean beaches, we would like that compliance to be at all our road ends, even on our bay beaches too. So we ask everyone to please continue to comply with that as we keep moving forward. Uh, we have had some issues at Ditch Plain beaches, some of the road ends, specifically uh, to, to the east there of non-compliance. And uh, I know the Marine Patrol and the chief were out in that area this morning, and we will continue to look for uh, compliance there. Uh, we have a lot of, I will send you some emails that I've received uh, about our junior lifeguarding program, uh, which started on Saturday successfully. I went up there on Saturday, Sunday, and even this morning uh, to our beaches by uh, spreading them out to different beaches and, and having them on more, on, on more days of the week. Uh, the group sizes are smaller and there are a lot of very happy parents and children right now. There's some wonderful pictures of the kids with masks, social distancing, at the same time learning about beach safety and ocean safety. I salute uh, uh, John Ryan Jr. and Sr. for moving that forward along with John Rooney. Talking about John Rooney, who is the department head of recreation, we wanna inform everyone uh, all of the recreation department's um, uh, programs and clinics are still accepting reg uh, registration. Please contact the recreation department at 324-4141 for further information. Also that uh, the youth park and the skate park are open hours right now uh, uh, with social distancing and signage in place. Um, wanted to let everyone know that the seaplane legislation that we discussed some while back was discussed at the trustee board meeting last night. The trustees did discuss it. I want to thank John Jelnicki, our town attorney, for addressing the trustees uh, very well last night. I was watching before my meeting, John. Thank you for doing so. Uh, answering any of their questions, we will be awaiting any comments from the trustees as we continue to move forward on that legislation to get it to uh, a public hearing. Um, the Nature Preserve Committee uh, met last week. We actually did uh, a social distancing field trip. Um, and if you've ever done a social distancing field trip with Rick Whalen, he will show you some trails. So we went out to Rods Valley, uh, where, we, uh, we, where we traversed Rods Valley to see how that park was being used. It's a beautiful site in the town of East Hampton. It was one, I wasn't on the board, of course, at that time, but the board at that time was one of the best purchases I think the town has ever done. A financial standpoint from what we got to how it's being used for the residents of East Hampton, specifically Montauk. We then crossed over to Eddie Ecker Park, which is an a, a, a old relic of Navy era. That's actually a county park. We talked about trying to do some more connector trails between those parks. And then we crossed over the, uh, the railroad tracks, the Palmanoc Path, which bisects the area. We went to the area that is uh, surrounding where the reclaimed uh, landfill area is. Uh, we got out there and it was, it, was a, it was a nice walk and we all got our heart rates up a little bit and uh, had some nice discussions on that. So I thank uh, Rick Whale and the chair of the Nation Preserve Committee for doing so. Uh, and I only found one tick, which I was happy. And I think we, I, uh, by, I ask you if you're going to do a TikTok video after that. Oh, yeah. I leave that to my daughters. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was, it was a nice, nice trip. And, uh, um, and we look forward to not, we were in business then, but getting back to some of the business they hand on paperwork next month. Um, Peter had mentioned, if you don't mind me, I'd like to do a screen share again. Uh, a couple of pictures from the, the Hedges Pars, the Burial Ground Preservation Group has started the restoration of the Hedges Parsons Cemetery this week on Old Stone Highway. And it, it, uh, it, was, it went quite magnificently. Uh, we will be getting a report from, the, uh, from Zach Studenroth uh, and Joel Snodengrass and, uh, and Kurt on, on the restoration very shortly and too. Uh, but I just wanted to share some, some wonderful pictures there. Uh, Jason, I'm just going to put this, or Mike, I'm just going to put this up quickly. Um, is that coming through to everyone? Yes. Yep. Okay, so what you're going to see here is um, 
just very simply just put, put this in a uh, couple of stones. You'll see on the left side here how much uh, uh, grime and dirt was built up on some of these stones as they're being cleaned. They're going to continuously you know, get a little bit whiter and cleaner as we move forward. You'll see on the right there one of the stones that was in a state of disrepair and broken. My next slide will show that stone back in the fall and how it is we uh, reinstalled and repaired pinned to the base stone and also for Miss Jessica Burns, who obviously died in 1873. And then lastly, you'll see uh, where um, uh, Mr. Seth Parsons, who died in uh, 1792, uh, that stone had been repaired because it was uh, on the ground broken into pieces. And then of course, the namesake, Hedges Parsons, um, who died in 16, 1865 there. Um, I look forward to having maybe a, a little bit more of a work session on that later on. But uh, I thank you the board for the support of that project. Uh, and I, I think the group did well. I welcome anyone to go up there. Uh, please uh, look at our rich history in our cemeteries. Uh, there is a sign that's outside that will be temporarily there that says uh, historical uh, cemetery restoration in progress. Uh, and lastly, I have uh, a being a good neighbor moment. I have a very good friend, uh, Larry Otto. Uh, Larry Otto actually asked me on his bike ride that he does in Montauk if he could borrow one of my reachers. A, a re if you ever had a hip replacement, a reacher is a long post that actually you could pick up. For me, it was picking up my socks and my shoes when you're going through rehab, but he also picked up trash. He put it on his back, and he had enough of seeing masks, and Larry had enough of seeing gloves on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. He said, wrote back to me, can I borrow your reacher again? Because I picked close to 80. I'm reading the text message. 80 to 100 masks and over 50 gloves, a lot in the ditch plane areas. And I, we mentioned this a long time ago. I think that it's one of the most disgusting things you can do in our township right now, and it's selfish. So kudos to Larry for using his PPE and cleaning our roads of masks and gloves. I hope everyone will just make it part of this time frame that we're in this pandemic to please dispose of masks and gloves appropriately. Uh, and I thank Larry Otto for taking that upon himself to be a good neighbor to the township of East Hampton. And that's my thanks, Larry. report. Thanks, David. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, that's uh, unbelievable. Thanks. Uh, thanks again. And Jeff, you have a liaison report for us? You're Jeff, muted, you're on Jeff. mute. Sorry. Yes, I do. I almost had a liaison report for AMAC, but we had internet problems uh, at town hall that prevented us from having the meeting. Yeah. Um, the Wayne Scott CAC met and um, is addressing uh, a highly controversial and probably important issue about whether or not to incorporate as a village under New York State town law. I don't know how many of the viewers are aware of the fact that there is a a process by which um, a geographic area can uh, decide on its own that it wants to have self-determination and become an incorporated village. We have several incorporated villages around and they basically run their own show, run their own uh, zoning and planning. So they had an informational meeting and I, I know Peter was there for part of the meeting. Uh, and they discussed, um, they're fairly well researched. They're in the process of uh, collecting signatures uh, on a petition. Uh, you have to get 20% of the population uh, to sign on to a petition. It's not unlike a nominating petition for an elective office. And they're in the process of accumulating uh, excess number of uh, signatures so that they can uh, pass that first uh, uh, test, basically. And the, the meeting was, uh, I would say, pretty informative. There was uh, a, a lot of light uh, offered on the subject. They discussed uh, some of the nuts and bolts issues like the, you know, the possibility of tax impacts, um, what would happen with uh, capital improvements in, uh, in Wayne Scott, uh, the experience of other incorporated villages. Uh, I guess the one nearby is uh, uh, Sagaponic. Uh, there was also a little heat with the light involved because it's uh, been a somewhat controversial subject. And I would say that the, uh, the people who attended the meeting had free and frank exchanges about 
what they saw the future being for Wayne Scott. Uh, the issues that they're concerned about are the predictable issues that we're all concerned about for Wayne Scott, the, gra the future of the gravel pit, uh, the airport, um, zoning in general, uh, landing the power line uh, for the Orsted project on Beach Lane. Uh, they're also concerned about water contamination and the like. And they discussed some of the nuts and bolts about how incorporated villages, which are smaller than towns, uh, can get their services rendered uh, by essentially uh, entering into uh, intermunicipal inter agreements. That is, you make agreements with other surrounding uh, municipalities uh, to provide services. We, we do some work like that for the East Hampton uh, village, which is an incorporated village. We uh, collect their taxes for them and, uh, and service those accounts uh, through the town. Um, and they, of course, uh, are also concerned about um, uh, the school district and fire and police and public works, uh, you know, those all those services that they would have to deal with. So it was a preliminary meeting to describe the process. Um, they seem fairly serious about embarking on it, and they're relatively well organized in 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 moving it along. When you say um, they, are you talking about the CAC, Jeff, or the Citizens for the Preservation of Wayne Scott? I'm confused. I'm talking about the presentation that was made at the Wayne Scott CAC. So they, being the presenters, are serious. Yeah, the presenters. I'm talking about this is a presentation. That, I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. This is a, this this occupied the entire meeting of the CAC. So I'm reporting on what the CAC uh, had them present and the discussion involved the CAC and then members of the public. Um, so Jeff, I, a quick question. I assume from what you said, they're worried about their school system. They're also worried that affordable housing might come to their hamlet. Uh, you know, Sylvia, uh, that is a, uh, a pointed comment um, that others have made about them uh, in the same way that they have made pointed comments about other people who would oppose incorporation. Uh, so my answer to that is, um, and, maybe, and here I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be a little lawyerly for everybody and say that one of the things I enjoy about the law is that when it works occasionally, and it does, and sets up a legal process, which we have in the state of New York for this kind of discussion, it creates a, a process that can be very thoughtful, deliberative, and fact-based. Um, there's a process they have to follow. There's an election. Um, it gives the folks on both sides an opportunity to discuss the facts. And I think drop off some of the attacks that both sides perceive to be happening or maybe planning. Um, I don't know what Wayne, I don't know if you can say what Wayne Scott feels about affordable housing. I mean, I've stated clearly for the I'm not board, talking about Wayne Scott. I was talking about the ad that they had in the paper where they were concerned about how affordable housing would affect their school system. Well, so, I think that is a concern that they've had. I'm not sure that that translates into Wayne Scott being opposed to affordable housing. My position is not even Wayne Scott, the people that are looking for incorporation. The, the ad was from the people that are um, uh, promoting incorporation. Well, those are residents of Wayne Scott, and this issue is a Wayne Scott wide issue that affects Wayne Scott residents. So I think what you're talking about is how do Wayne Scott residents feel about affordable housing? Are they concerned about their school? Yes, they're concerned about their school. Is, you know, uh, is there opposition uh, to affordable housing? I'm reluctant to say that. My, you know, my position even as a liaison is that every Hamlet has a responsibility for affordable housing. So you know, I think uh, my suggestion to, to us as a town board and to uh, the Wayne Scott folks who are either involved in it or not involved in it is to sort of focus on facts, not fears. Um, and I think uh, we'll get to a, a more reasoned uh, discussion and a more illuminating um, a process that will really disclose the facts that are operative. You know, when people in a hamlet um, come up with the idea that they don't wanna be a part of a town, 
um, there are usually substantive reasons for it. I'm not saying that they're persuasive or compelling. I don't have a position on this issue at the moment. I frankly, uh, I attended the meeting uh, interested in hearing uh, and learning a little bit about the process. And, you know, I did, I actually did a little research into the law as well. So I'm, you know, rather than, you know, drawing swords and saying, oh, Wayne Scott doesn't want affordable housing or, you know, they're against wind power and they are taken over by a small minority, I, I would prefer to see a reasoned, deliberative discussion about the issues that they think um, suggest that they could do a better job running their own show. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to hearing whatever the evidence is, and I think that the process is probably a good one for everyone. I've been involved on sort of both sides of this issue. I'm, I'm involved in a, in a legal case in my other life in which uh, a, a project was proposed in a hamlet, and that hamlet decided they were going to incorporate. My feeling at the time was they, were, they wanted to do it because they wanted to promote this, this development project. So sometimes when people want to uh, create a, an incorporated village, uh, from my point of view, it's not for the right reasons, but sometimes it's for the right reasons. I think we just have to wait and see um, how the discussion uh, plays out. Um, it, it was a um, it was a very orderly meeting and a very informative meeting. Uh, Peter was there for part of it. He, I'm sure, will want to you know make some comments about uh, his reaction to it. So, I mean, at this point, my my sense of the issue is that it needs to uh, it needs to run the course that's prescribed under the New York State. Um, village incorporation law, which is, you know, rigorous and orderly, and I think it will help everybody. And I'm, I'm hoping it lowers the temperature in the room for the discussions and that people are, you know, not swinging hammers at each other and are, are listening to each other. I think we'll get there. And I don't know whether it's going to succeed or, or not succeed, but it was quite an interesting, quite an interesting meeting and uh, uh, very worthwhile to listen in on. And there are still some questions they have to answer. There was some, uh, you know, Peter was disputing whether or not they could, you know, what it would cost to run um, a small village. Um, there are some differences between Sagaponic and Wayne Scott. Wayne Scott has a commercial center. Um, you know, I've dealt with boards in incorporated villages um, all over the East End, and uh, they're generally able to uh, handle their own zoning and planning issues. Um, I was also very active in Southampton at the time that Sagaponic broke away and, you know, thought that they had good reason to break away. So sometimes I've seen it and thought it was not a good idea. And other, other times I've seen it and I thought it was a good idea. Um, I think the facts will come out and we'll, we'll figure it out and the residents will ultimately vote on it and we'll see where the chips fall. Jeff, can um, I ask you a question? Was there sure. a, was there a PowerPoint presented at the meeting? And is it something that you could share with us? Um, yes, there was a PowerPoint. Yes, it's been recorded. Peter already has the recording, I believe. I think it was sent around by Carolyn um, uh, Logan Gluck, and I can ask her uh, to send she it. Said to she said she sent it to both you and I, Jeff. Yeah, so I didn't get you it. You should have it. Okay, I, okay. Yeah, I'll send it around. Yeah, it's, Thank it's, you. She, re she recorded the whole thing. So you but there wasn't a hard copy of a, of a PowerPoint presentation that was... Uh, no, no, not, not that I know. But, but it, you know, it's a PowerPoint on the screen, so you'll get a pretty good view of it. And I think the, the meeting, you'll get a pretty good sense of what Great. the meeting was like. It was, it was orderly. I mean, certainly there's disagreement in the room, but it was, um, it, it was an orderly uh, beginning of a discussion of these issues. Uh, there are issues that, you know, still remain to be... Uh, I think fleshed out a little bit, um, as you would expect. It's you know it's got some complexity, but it was a it was a good start in the sense that um, it, it was factual and discussed some of the procedures that were involved, which I think is you know a good starting point. Where it will end, I can't predict, but um, it, it it was an interesting interesting meeting to attend. Um, so I don't. This is a short liaison report because I didn't have AMAC because of. Uh, uh, the problems with uh, the internet. And the only other thing I wanted to mention was, um, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge um, 
a letter that was in the Star um, from, uh, now I'm not going to get his name, it's, it's a reverend at one of the churches in Amagansett, in which he suggested that some, that the Wainscott Green uh, contain uh, some uh, commemoration of the swamp as a, an accepting location uh, for the gay community, which I thought was uh, a good suggestion. It was Reverend Robert Stewart. I just wanted to acknowledge that we, we, got, we got that letter. I saw that letter and um, I know that the uh, Wayne Scott CAC has discussed that in the past and may again, and then if they do, they'll come back to the town. Board I believe we received, I thought we had received a letter from the CAC actually making note of that perhaps I thought it was in the management else, plan but it we, is, we did it is in the, it, we acknowledged it in the in the management plan and i definitely think it would be worth uh, putting a marker of some sort commemorating uh that location yes uh yes. as as an accepting location for for those who uh you know are a, a gay lesbian background and, and whatnot okay. and and uh at a time when I think, uh, you know, people uh, were not accepted uh, widely uh, for their, their sexual orientation or preference. And um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I think we've come a long way. I think we have a lot further to go in terms of being accepting of each other, uh, just as a, as a species, but I certainly would support uh, commemorating plaque of that kind. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a good idea. And, you know, it also it was, uh, I mean, I remember uh, out here when uh, the AIDS um, epidemic hit and uh, uh, an activist friend of mine actually in town government, I can say his name because he, it's uh, Steve Miller, who was a good friend and a planning board uh, chair and very active uh, in politics was one of the earliest people to come out as, as having uh, AIDS at a time when uh, it really wasn't clear how well he would do. And I'm, th I'm thankful every day that I still have him as a friend and <laughs> see him around. And um, it's a reminder that during that era uh, of another epidemic uh, and perhaps an epidemic that got less attention than it should have for a long period of time, that places like the swamp and the uh, fact that the community could congregate there safely were important, you know, sources of support uh, in a really perilous, dangerous time, probably, you know, as scary as the time of COVID. So it's got a serious side. It was, you know, a fun disco. And, you know, I know folks like to go there to dance, uh, but there was a serious side to it as well. And I would love to see that commemorated. I'm glad the board supports it. So that's what I have as a Thank you, Jeff. So um, I just want to go over uh, briefly the. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, Sylvia. <laughs> How do I do that? I've done that like two meetings in a row. I usually, I, I normally would have gone to you before Jeff. And so. I don't, I, I don't know maybe where. It's, I, maybe it's because of the screen or something, but please go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I promise I won't be highly in. offended. <laughs> so, um, the uh, um, Antibias Task Force met, and the focus is on um, racism in our community and addressing that through education. Um, to that end, with the considerable help of Village Police Chief uh, Mike Tracy, we're going to move forward with our diversity show at LTV. So you may recall that one show was produced uh, right towards the end of um, February, beginning of March of this year, with Hugh King as the moderator and Edna Steck and Audrey Gaines, two members of the Antibias Task Force that were the guests. Um, LTV is again gonna help us in producing a new show. And this time it can be in the studio. It's towards the end of this month on, on, the, eight, on the 29th. Um, and they will be having social distancing within the studio. Um, and the guest is Teresa Roden. And some of you know Teresa, she's the founder of iTry. And it's a not-for-profit that empowers girls by using a triathlete competition 
um, as a goal, even though it may seem impossible to many of the girls, given the tools, support, and the friendships that they encounter along the way, they can find that a difficult goal can be achieved. So um, she would be the next guest at the end of this month, and then we hope to continue with other people that are already um, in the pipeline to um, uh, become guests on our diversity show. Um, future programs we think is important uh, for our community and they are in the planning stages. Actions by the anti-bias task force need to be supported by additional funds uh, from the town to continue work in the schools, printed material that's needed, um, to the broader community with educational programs and outreach. And we hope that um, during this time of looking at our budget for 2021, there will be some money in it for support for these types of educational programs. Um, I think it's needed now more than ever. And uh, we'll look into, um, and I hope you'll be supportive and open our pockets so that we can help um, that the anti-bias task force work with the community at large um, to address these issues that uh, you know may or may not be within our community, LBT issues, um, the you know racism issues of all sorts. Um, the uh, village is endeavoring to set up an accessory apartment law and commercial structures modeled after the towns and um, with regards to the occupancy permits being affordable um, under the affordable housing. Um, uh, so I had a meeting, um, uh, actually I, I was updated because of the same issue that Jeff had with the internet on Friday. Uh, there was a meeting with Rebecca Molinari, the administrator for the village, with Beth Baldwin, the uh, village attorney, and Tom Rule from um, the Office of Development, uh, Community Development. And so what they're looking for is, um, since, um, since the village, uh, the, the, he's an administrator, the town is paid from, um, his office is paid from the whole fund, which includes the village. So it's most likely not to have a large, although it's, it probably won't have a large number of permits at the village. The idea would be for um, the Office of Community Housing to be the administrator of the permits for the village. And the village would handle the building permit process and the enforcement part um, in conjunction with the Office of Housing and Community Development. So what this would require is a local law and a memorandum of agreement um, between the town and the village, but it would re require that the town approve and go ahead with this. So I don't know if you want to have a work session on this particular project, if you would like um, Tom to be there at a work session to tell you exactly what his office would be doing, or if you feel um, it's a good time to work with John Dilnicki and we can present that to um, you at, a, at another date that we would have a permit and a memorandum of agreement with the village. The question. Board members. <laughs> what, 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 is the, what would the board like to do? Board members. Have a little discussion on it. So would, would you, uh, so this is something that the village is wanting to do for their own commercial. You know, if you're familiar with what we do in the town, is that when commercial projects come in, they can put an affordable apartment above. Um, some uh, businesses even have two affordable apartments above um, their works, the workspace. It doesn't have to be workspace that the people in the affordable apartments actually work in, but it's been very helpful. Um, and as it comes through the planning process, you know, there are certain criteria that there has to be some outdoor space uh, for recreation. There has to be a separate ingress and egress for the apartment itself. It can't be over 600 square feet. They're all one bedroom. Um, so, so there are some criteria that we have that the village would like to, you know, um, have as part of their um, legislation, but they would like the town to be the administrator of it. So when the town board, I mean, when the planning board would okay and approve these apartments, affordable apartments, they would then send that information to Tom Rule's department. And then he would either A, look for a tenant um, himself or the people that own the business can look for their own tenants. 
Um, also in our law is if you own the building and you have um, children or, or employees that, excuse me, that want to come back and work within the town, then you can use it yourself um, as long as you register it with the, uh, the town rules department. So that would be the type of thing that uh, the village would like to do. And I'm in support of having the village also work towards having affordable apartments above their commercial structures. So, so basically we are, our program, we would manage the program for the village, is that, is that as I understand it? And so an intermunicipal agreement to do so and then compensate, yeah. compensation by the village for us taking on that responsibility. So I, I would think we wait until we were ready to, to do that resolution, right? Because it it's going to need a, an IMA. And yeah. I, yeah. I would think we would wait until have the work session the Tuesday prior to us, you know, moving forward That's, with that yeah. resolution. You have to understand what the terms of the agreement would be as part of the IMA too. I think. Right. right. So yeah. Which we, which we typically is something that we, um, you know, discuss with the town attorney's office in executive session at some point some of it is you know negotiation yeah, or discussion you would negotiate yeah right so, so the, uh, my overall, question, I'm, I'm supportive of looking into it sylvia yeah, yeah okay. we're, 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 so my question is do you want to have another meeting just on the mechanics of this or would you like john to start working with beth so that he can present yeah, i think just work yes. with beth i think you I work think with we, beth we kind of understand the mechanics yeah because we're doing it Okay. It's right. Just a matter of uh, working out an IMA. Okay. So John, you got that? Okay. Um, so while while we're yeah, can I ask you? Do they have a statute? You know, draw. Have they drafted a statute on this? Not, no, not yet. Okay. So that would be obviously part of the package. Okay. Yeah, at. I would have John then work with Beth so we can get it all in one package. Right. Okay. Um. John sent me some information and I just want to go over this with the town board on um, what he can call the Hoffman stairs. So Mr. Hoffman recently received a ZBA approval to replace a set of badly damaged beach stairs. A condition of the ZBA approval is town board approval to allow the contractor to use dirt lot in ditch plains um, if needed to access the beach to remove the broken up stairs. So they did send along um, a um, uh, all the approvals that they had received and, an, um, and a survey. Um, the work will be done in the fall and access to the beach would be made very um, early in the morning and it would require a four by four truck or a small ATV. Nothing will be stored in dirt lot. So um, this is from Drew Bennett who is asking, who is working on this project and wanted to know if the town would approve that agenda. My only caveat was that he doesn't say in it what fall means, and I would not want this to happen during September because the beaches are still quite active in September, especially depending on how the school year goes. So to have it done in fall, um, we can either say it has to be done within a time frame, sometime in October or November. Um, how does the town board feel, and what? Maybe how would later, like maybe even later October, because there there are many years where mid October is still. Yeah. Sylvia, where are these stairs at? What location? Um, there, it's over by. Um, uh, they, I'm. I don't, John. Exactly. Um, I don't know the prop. Which property? Like the Montauk Association, or? I don't know. I'd have to. I'd have to get. The, I don't have the zoning board approval. We just got the request to use the dirt lot for um, for access. But dirt I think lot. Lot, they're going to use the, the dirt lot, lot or dirt lot. It's a dirt lot. It's not the okay. dirt lot, though. It's what? Dirt lot is the beach uh, at Ditch. Yeah. So are you, is it that parking lot? Yes. I no. thought it was. Sure. And so are they going on the beach to the east of there or to the west of there? Um, I don't know. I didn't pull it up. I think it's going to be to the west of there. I mean, to the east of there. They're going how to. Are they gonna get, how are they going to get around Montauk Shores and that? They have to use part of Montauk Shores property to cross over. Uh, that's uh, better go on low tide. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if there's any beach there. I don't think that they're going to use the beach to cross over. 
I would assume they'd give us some kind of assurance that they'd remediate anything, you know, any damage to the beach. Yeah, I, I think this also goes to to two points. This is yeah. So uh, there, I, I'll, I'll bring it up. I'll share this with you guys. Uh, have it up on the on the map. Let's see. There's also a section of the code I know Kathy has has mentioned in the past about um, they have to pay for the the temporary use of it. I know recently down in Barnes Landing there was a temporary use granted, not necessarily by the town board, but by other another agency, and some of that material has been there for for months. It's still there. As of I haven't been there in maybe a week and a half, but as of a couple of weeks ago, um, when the, when a picture came in, yes. So I would like to make sure that you know there's a timeline to removal of any of their material. Okay. Okay, let's, I don't know. Try it again here. Here we go. So Hoffman is right here. Can you see my cursor? Mm -hmm. Yes. So Hoffman's here, third lot here. And there's the uh, Montauk Shores. There's Montauk Shores. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Sure. Okay, Sylvie, do you have anything else? Um, yeah, so the Energy Sustainability Committee uh, also uh, wants to move forward with the discussion about possible legislation that would minimize the use of gas and diesel leaf blowers. Um, obviously, alternatives would be electric, either plug-in or um, rechargeable leaf blowers. And I'd ask Peter if we could schedule a work session for this in sometime in August. Um, and he said either date was fine, either August 4th or 11th. So I just wanted to let you know that that was forthcoming. I sent you all a letter from the Energy Sustainability Committee. The town board should have received that. Hopefully you guys. Uh, Sylvia, I don't, I don't know if maybe we should include this in our discussions about leaf blowers, but I, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have received um, for some time, you know, yeah. uh, emails from residents, various residents asking me about further restrictions on the hours of operation of those, uh, that equipment, uh, whether or not certain days should be excluded, whether or not there should be even a seasonal ban like many communities have adopted. And frankly, more recently, I have had a flood of, uh, and I think part, partially it's the fact that, you know, we're all in lockdown uh, for so long with uh, COVID that people were you know, it's starting to enjoy the quiet of their homes and then realize that once the leaf blowing started up again, uh, just how loud and how often their lives were disrupted by that. So I, I think, I wonder if there's just not a, a broader discussion to have as well, not just the types of, of leaf blowers, but maybe even a consideration of the well, hours. So, so this would address some of that because the electric leaf blowers would, could only be used, would be used mostly during the summer season and um so and and it lays it out and i'll have uh one of the members on the the um work session that talks about the use of electric leaf blowers and how um we probably they they don't do the job of a huge um cleanup that you would have in the fall they're just not powerful enough but they would be powerful enough to do the jobs during the summer seasons when people are just getting, you know, grass cuttings off of their lawns and, and that kind of thing. So um, I, I don't know if, if this would help solve. Well, it's also been pointed out to me that just whether it's leaf blowers or mowers or whatever uh, construction equipment, that the, the town basically allows that to occur between the hours of 7 a.m. and 8.30 p.m. That's seven right. days a week. And I, I frankly am getting to the point where um, between the numbers of constituents that are asking for some further reduction of those hours uh, and the disruption that it just causes to the quiet enjoyment of one's homes, that maybe it's time that we take up a more comprehensive look at that issue as well. I don't know, just putting it out there. Yeah, well, that's a different section of the code. So we could, we could certainly do that with the noise um, and the construction hour times. 
So, and I'd like to take that back to, um, well, right now it's really just the business recovery group, but, and, and we do have at least one construction um, company there, but I think they need to be considered as well and, and get their input. I have a feeling Absolutely. it would be okay if we do some of it. Um, but anyway, let's, I, I think that is, it's a broader and a different discussion in a way. Well, if you, you like, want to just take it, you know, one step at a time, we'll, you yeah. know, we can start with the electric blowers and then uh, maybe at a future date. Yeah, the electric blowers are much quieter so that I, I, um, you know, maybe we would have a demonstration at some point in time, have someone come over and show us what an electric blower, a professional electric blower looks, uh, you know, sounds like so that we can kind of understand the noise level. Um, right. and, and anyway, that they would like to move forward with that legislation um, or starting to consider that legislation, but first have a work session so that you guys understand what it is. Uh, the Natural Resources Department and specifically Lauren Steinberg, um, as I mentioned, I think in the last report, we're renewing the status as a climate smart community. We need to do that um, between now and, and uh, it, it comes up sometime next year in 2021. There are over 100 items that we need to address and then submit um, so we can become a climate smart community again. And so at this point, they're asking the town to implement policy issues that would count towards being a climate smart community. And that would be um, on any new or renovated building uh, that is a municipal building that we would commit to LEED standards, um, which is leadership and energy and environmental design standards or energy star standards. Um, additionally, they would ask that the town also consider um, passing a policy for fleet efficiency. So this would be for any motor vehicles that we have. And then again, we would address what that uh, fleet efficiency looks like. Number of electric cars, number of hybrid cars, that kind of thing that um, whether or not we're going to use biofuels for any of our trucks instead of and replacing it with diesel. So those would be some of the um, efficiency things that we would have to look at um, for Climate Smart. And this, if we could do this during a work session, I'd have Lauren talk about some of those issues in August as well. Be very happy to put that on the agenda. Okay, great. Um, the business recovery groups continues to meet every Wednesday. Um, the discussions after the 4th of July weekend were focused mostly on, um, you know, keeping how to keep patrons uh, for all types of businesses, including retail restaurants and motels. Um, that they need to be vigilant about wearing masks and social distancing. Uh, the, you know, they were very clear that they understand that their businesses, their livelihood depends on people feeling safe, but also practicing safe guidelines as wearing masks and distancing. Um, to some degree, the businesses, I think, are self-policing um, and felt that they were talking to each other and that this was a, a good opportunity actually for businesses to continue to have a conversation on making sure that they don't slide backwards. And that is the biggest fear is that we will see an uptick, which uh, there's an article today about an uptick and, and specifically a party that was held in Suffolk County. It doesn't say the location exactly, but a, a 4th of July party where one third of the people, over one third of the people now have COVID. Um, so again, we have to stay vigilant. Um, I think that the recovery group is very well aware of this. And um, I, I think that they have a big voice in the community that they can offer in helping us make sure that people are complying with masks and, um, social distancing so and they are very appreciative of the town's enforcement presence that was um in montauk and they they were especially called out some of the um fire marshal folks and and uh, the police um themselves so thank you to uh the recovery group for again i think part of what we're going to have to depend on is that they they make sure their patrons stay vigilant as one manager of a restaurant said to me, I asked her how it was going. She said, I'm tired of being a policeman and having to tell all of these folks to, you know, have to wear their masks as they 
you know, go to the restroom or as they're standing in, at, at, in the restaurant. But they're doing it, and uh, hopefully they will continue to, to, to do that. And that is all I have. Well, thank you, Sylvie. And, and that'll be my segue for the beginning of my liaison report, which um, I, I really wanted to talk about uh, weekend enforcement. We had uh, East Hampton Town Police, the fire marshal's office, and state liquor authority all working together, visiting establishments throughout the town um, for the weekend and found virtually all of them in compliance this past weekend, which was uh, an improvement. Uh, the previous weekend, we had three locations that were problematic. Um, those problem locations uh, really had no problems with the exception of one, which was Rush Myers that had some minor SLA issues. And then they also had a outdoor music amplified after nine citation. So, um, but all in all, everything else was operating uh, within the guidelines for both COVID and State Liquor Authority. I'm very pleased about that. Um, you know, I think our community really responded um, and, and let, let us know that uh, we were on the right track when we uh, cracked down on those places that were not following the guidelines. I'm, I'm really pleased to see people following the guidelines now. We need to continue that. We need to be vigilant. As uh, Sylvie was talking about, a party in Suffolk County that resulted in 30% of the participants becoming infected with covid that is exactly the kind of uh, situation that this disease thrives on. Gatherings of large groups of people who are not wearing masks. Uh, we still need to wear masks when we're in close proximity to each other. I think this is gonna be something that we're gonna be uh, having to do for the foreseeable future. Uh, we can't let our guard down. Uh, just during the time that we've been in this meeting, uh, the governor has sent out um, a list of additional states that will have to be added uh, to that uh, list of uh, mandatory quarantine um, locations. If you're traveling from Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, California, Delaware has been removed. So good, good job, Delaware. Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Idaho, Kansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, Nevada, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Texas, Tennessee, Utah, uh, Minnesota, and uh, new on that list is New Mexico, Ohio, and Wisconsin. So we're now up to 21 states. If you've traveled in the last 14 days from one of those 21 states and you come into New York, you are required to mandatorily uh, quarantine for 14 days. Uh, you are required, if you are flying in, to uh, fill out the form. Uh, if you've been from one of those states, um, that posting will be at our town airport. I've been in contact with Jim Brundage, the airport manager, and he is working on a plan to implement with uh, the FBO operator sound to ensure that uh, those arriving at the airport understand what those rules are. Um, and he will be submitting that plan, which I will circulate to the board members uh, once I receive it. Um, I think uh, on, a, on a happy note, over the weekend on Sunday, we had a ribbon cutting ceremony, socially distanced, and that was uh, Lucia Ibrahim, who's a, a Girl Scout who did for a gold project, uh, the rebuilding of Camp Noweska. This was an incredibly ambitious project that she selected. Camp Norweska was built 50 some odd years ago uh, for use by Girl Scouts on town property. And we've had a license agreement with the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts to use that property off Old House Landing. Uh, we had a major uh, historic um, snowstorm a few years back where we received 36 inches of snow. I think it was the greatest snowfall ever recorded in the town of East Hampton, which collapsed the roof on the old structure. And um, she took the project on to rebuild it. She uh, got uh, various, uh, she got architect Bill Chaliff to, to do the drawings uh, pro bono. She got a number of contractors to um, donate their, their services, the Riverhead Building Supply, uh, donated a number of materials, uh, and she uh, went through the whole process of getting building permit, uh, doing all the groundwork, 
Um, and it's really amazing what she was able to accomplish. The building is really beautiful. And right at the very end, uh, as she ran out of money um, and was reminded that we have ADA standards and uh, the town kicked in an additional $5,000, uh, thank the board for supporting that to build the uh, ramp that you see in the background. So we had a, a really nice dedication, a really shining example of someone who has uh, done a great deal of work um, and really benefited all, all the members of our community with some with a lasting gift really to the town of East Hampton. So I wanna thank her uh, from the bottom of my heart and I know that you all have supported her. It's been remarkable and fun watching her uh, grow and mature. She came to us with a silver project several years ago, uh, went to address the board, completely froze during the headlights at the podium. Pretty intimidating, I think, uh, especially for a young person, not used to public speaking, coming to the town board. Um, uh, she, she got through that and uh, has gained so much confidence. It's really been fun to watch her grow. So congratulations again, and thank you to Lucia. Uh, we will be um, issuing co-op beach permits uh, for those who are co-op owners within the town, they'll be eligible. I have a resolution on today to adjust the fee schedule to be more in line with the family permits that will go from $75 to $100. And Carol will start and the clerks will start issuing those permits tomorrow on passing of the resolution. Uh, we also have um, uh, a discussion that, I, that I'd like to have in just a moment about uh, fitness business applications for outdoor. Uh, but first I wanna talk about, we'll have a resolution on to hire a consulting engineer for the Montauk wastewater a map and plan. Um, that's part of creation of a sewer district for downtown Montauk. And uh, we'll put out that RFP. It'll be due back on September 24th. I'll have that on Thursday's meeting. Um, I put together a letter in support of federal legislation to exempt IA septic upgrade grants from taxable status. As you may know, um, 1099s have been issued for those grants, and uh, we feel that uh, they, sh they really should be exempt. There's, there's broad and great public benefit to installing improved IA systems. Representative Tom Swazi, Congressman Swazi, is sponsoring this bill. Um, I will circulate a letter of support. If you care to sign on, uh, that letter would uh, probably go out today. So if uh, you'll look for that in your inbox and, and let me know if uh, I can attach your signature to it. Um, likewise, a letter of support of the Suffolk County Department of Health requiring of IAs for new construction and substantial reconstruction. As the board members know, we adopted legislation that requires new construction and substantial restructured reconstruction to uh, upgrade to an IA system. The county health department is rec recommending that uh, countywide. There's been some pushback and reluctance on behalf of some of the county legislators to adopt this. I understand because they are afraid that uh, given our economic circumstances right now, that that would be undue burden. Um, but really the, the cost differential between an IA system and a conventional system in almost all cases for new construction is uh, $4,000 to $5,000. And uh, I just think that the, the costs uh, to our environment and the long-term costs of remediation of our surface waters and groundwater due to contamination from nitrogen far outweigh these costs, which can be amortized in a 30-year mortgage and result in, in really not a lot of impact to the building industry. Um, so I'll ask also if you might support that letter. Um, going back to the fitness business discussion, we're in phase four now and a number of fitness businesses throughout the town have been hit very hard and have to close. Um, some fitness businesses do have outdoor space and by executive order uh, are allowed to socially distance exercise classes, yoga, Pilates, whatever, on their own property. 
but uh, there are a number of existing businesses that don't have the physical space outdoors to do that. And as we did with outdoor dining, we've relaxed some of the zoning laws um, so that businesses can, uh, can operate and uh, hopefully recover from what's been a really devastating impact. And much like the uh, outdoor dining law model on that, I think it's important that we have an application process so that uh, if there are businesses taking advantage of operating on uh, another site that is commercially zoned, uh, if issues arise that we have the ability to uh, revoke that permit. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an effort that's worth undertaking. Uh, I don't think it'll have any significant impacts and that there are ways to address any impacts that pop up. So I know I've sent this around to all the board members. I don't know if you wanna take some time to go through it now or if you've already looked at it, if you had any questions or concerns about it, uh, we could discuss them now. I would like to issue on the next renewal of the executive order uh, this process, uh, have this included in, the, in that order. Um, no, I mean, Peter, um, I know the fitness industry in East Hampton very well. Um, I, I do think this is uh, one, of the, one means that we can actually assist with those businesses um, and their employees to have a location where they can potentially uh, still do their work in a safe way through the guidance of the governor. At the same time, there'll be no vested rights to zoning uh, in the locations that they might, might, might go to uh, and that the design would not be an overburden to parking and again, just being a temporary relief. So I'm supportive of it. I am too. No Other problem. board members? Yeah, and I think, and I look at the guidelines too, the hours that you've uh, delineated is 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. and that it shall expire on November 1st, I think is all reasonable. Right, although unless, by, unless by, we're both previous. Yeah, yeah. Right, although I'm, I'm not sure when daylight savings time kicks in, so it may. <laughs> It may right be after, too dark by then. To, no, to right after. Uh, yeah, right after Halloween is when right, daylight. Right. And, it, and it may be, but uh, and and again, you know, depending on the, where we are with the conditions um, and the status of in, to, indoors uh, indoor exercise and fitness, you know, right now they're not they're not allowed to um, take place indoors. Uh, and I think this, and again, this would only be uh, for eligible uh, local businesses. We're not going to invite people in to pop up. Uh, it's going to have to be an existing business. And uh, again, they'll have to follow this format. Obviously, you know, in alignment with the, the protocols issued by the state um, with the ability to revoke if there are any issues or problems. So I appreciate the board's uh, support for that. And um, I guess that brings us to the Wainstead Corporation that Jeff spoke about earlier. And, you know, I have my own personal feelings about uh, incorporation. Um, and, and I think it's unfortunate that those who are promoting it, um, specifically the citizens for the preservation of, of, uh, of Wayne Scott would decide to, to uh, make personal attacks against the supervisor, particularly taking out a full page ad on 4th of July. I think that's really unfortunate. I think having a civil discussion about incorporation based on facts um, is extremely important. I think uh, that the citizens of Wayne Scott should very carefully consider um, any move to incorporate and what the unintended consequences of doing so might be. Um, it's, you know, uh, currently, uh, I think one of the issues that has been expressed is that the town board uh, and specifically the supervisor has ignored Wayne Scott, doesn't take Wayne Scott seriously, um, accusations that haven't supported their cultural, their agricultural history and uh, whatnot. I just, I think that the record has stated uh, fairly uh, shows that the supervisor 
has facilitated nearly 100 acres of property within the boundaries of Wayne Scott to be preserved during his term. That the supervisor got Bathgate Road, which was an absolutely horrendous mud hole paved. Um, that uh, you know we've preserved as a board um, agricultural land. I was on the planning board when the 55 Wayne Scott Hollow subdivision came up, which I rejected. I voted against it. Uh, it, it eventually did get uh, permission for some lots, but uh, I was in the voting majority against that development. Uh, we worked to preserve the Wegley property, which is where the Wayne Scott farm stand, the Binsky farm stand is, that four acres. Uh, so I think it, it's unfortunate that recent arrivals have decided that um, that the town board and the, the uh, supervisor haven't been supportive of Wayne Scott. I think uh, Wayne Scott's an amazing hamlet, that it's uh, unique from all the rest. And as I said at the meeting the other day, uh, no one gets to be on the town board. No one's elected to town board without understanding the very unique character of each of our hamlets and their own specific needs. Um, and, and I just think that uh, careful consideration, particularly I'm concerned about zoning laws. Um, because incorporating without letting the citizens of Wayne Scott know what that zoning code will look like, um, I think is, is dangerous. I think they should understand what they're buying into in terms of preservation. Wayne Scott has a 70 acre parcel that's up for development. And I, I guess I'm confused by the statement that, uh, you know, we want autonomy, but yet it was said at the meeting that um, we would just rely on the town to provide all the services that they pro provide now, police, highway department, planning. Uh, you know, I think, I think it's naive to think you can run a village on two or $300,000 in the budget. I think that's misstated, but uh, I think it's important to have a full and honest review of the facts and uh, the potential implications uh, one of the questions that I thought was very astute that was brought up by Wayne Scott resident was, well, how will you finance the uh, the advancement of the Wayne Scott Hamlet plan? Which, by the way, for those who might recall, I was the liaison to Wayne Scott that initiated the very first Hamlet study within this town. And, and uh, with the support of Sylvia and uh, a majority board member, Dominic Stanzion, we were able to get that study started back in 2012. And it wasn't until Larry Cantwell came in that we were able to incorporate all the other hamlets as well in that study. So how, how would you advance that? How would you do the improvements, the purchase of land, whatever, in order of uh, building of sidewalks to make a more, more walkable hamlet and still keep your uh, cost 200 to $300,000? So I think it, it it really deserves very careful analysis. Um, I think, you know, ultimately there was a call uh, among many of the participants to not personalize the discussion, not to make personal attacks, uh, but to really review the facts. And I, I've always felt that when you resort to personal attacks, you've, you've already lost the argument. If you have a strong argument, it should succeed on its merits. Uh, but that's that's really all I have to say, other than I, I think there is a gulf, there's a divide that's occurred between uh, the town board and some of the Wayne Scott residents that's directly related to uh, our uh, interest in bringing renewable energy to East Hampton, and specifically with the cable route. I think that's unfortunate. I think we need to redouble our efforts and I'm committed to redoubling my efforts to speak directly with Wayne Scott residents to hear what their concerns are. I think it's important to understand as thoroughly uh, their, their perspectives um, and that it's important that they understand ours. So I, I hope we can continue that dialogue in a constructive way and uh, Again, I think careful vetting 
of any such proposal is 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 incumbent on uh, on all of us. And I think that's it for my liaison report. And I would like to do a resolution. And this relates to the co-op fee for uh, parking permits in the town. It's resolution 2020. 694, and that's to amend the beach parking fee pursuant to Chapter 240, Vehicles and Traffic, Article uh, 6, Parking Permit. And that fee will again go to $100 for non resident cooperative ownership parking permit. And those will be uh, issued tomorrow based on this resolution passing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed and carried. Um, and do we have any anything to discuss in executive session? Yes. So John, we'll John, you. John, you're muted. Yeah, I have I have at least one thing I need to discuss in exec session if I could. What's the nature of that? Is it contracts, personnel, acquisition? It's a contract um, issue. Okay. All right, I make a motion that we go into exec session at 3.15 right now. 3.45, is that Great. 30 minutes enough time for you? Take a one break. Go into exec session at 3.45 to discuss contracts. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's great. Thanks very much, everyone. Stay safe. I'll send the link for the exec. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.